Good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Today is Tuesday, March 26th. May I have a call to order, please? Mr. Kaling? Present. Mr. Quadro? I imagine we'll be here shortly. Uh, Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Mayor Ciara? Here. Dr. Bonner? Here. Thank you. Um, can we have permission, Steve? You don't want to push? Is that flip no or? Oh, it's up to you. I, I can do it. You want to? Sure. Okay. Mission statement. Smith Vocational oh, Agricultural sorry, High School is to prepare students. I thought you meant you'd say the pledge. Oh, I do we usually start with the pledge. Well, I was looking at here and in, 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 uh, you're right. It's out of board. So okay. I can do the pledge. Awesome. Everybody stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and justice for all. Thank you. Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School, the mission of Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there any participation by the public this evening? I'm just here for the meeting. Oh, Perfect. Okay. Participation by the trustees? Um, well, we get to the building part of the <laughs> uh, meeting at some point. Um, committee reports. Um, yeah, I do have a little something. Um, and I mentioned this to uh, Joe at the advisory dinner. Um, the pig roast. How about we have a real pig roast? As per? As per roasting a pig. Okay. I'm uh, just throwing it out there. Um, I think they used to do that in the past. I'm not sure about it. The way past. And the way past. Um, I think the sign's a little misleading. It says pig roast, and people, I think some people, I, I know I did at first when I first came to it, was expecting a real pig roast, um, as opposed to it being served from the cafeteria kitchen. That's my two cents worth. Okay, duly noted. Uh, I did want to make a report that um, out of the St. Patrick's Day Parade, our float from Smith Vocational, uh, turned on, became a third place winner in one of the categories. And I'm very proud of the students because it's a handmade float uh, the, by the direction of the two uh, instructors. But there was a lot of hard work and sweat equity that went into this. And I was glad to see them get rewarded uh, by getting an award and bringing it back. And from the reports that I got from James and Mark, that they were so excited, the students, that they're ready to do it next year. And normally we alternate, but we'll see what happens. So I just wanted to share that. At this time, I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the February 20th, 24th Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. Additional discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 I'll abstain, just because I wasn't here. At this time, we're going to have the school's spotlight. Yeah, so we're going to uh, introduce Mr. Bianca, the principal, who uh, wants to take the opportunity to be here with the board. And uh, the recent NEAC visit that we had last week. So, Joe? Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, just wanted to go through and take the opportunity tonight. Um, so one of the things that you have that I did distribute uh, was the school self-reflection report. Uh, and I can share that with Debbie uh, electronically because there are hyperlinks that are in it that will bring you to specific documents and other things that we did prepare for the visiting committee. Um, so, go through and I just want to highlight a few things. <clears throat> First off, the process that we used really began back in December of 2022. 
Uh, and in that, we formed our self-reflection committees. So staff were asked to give us their input on which committee they wanted to sit on. There's five standards in NEAS. And what we chose to do, everybody sort of has your, your, they have their best practices or guidelines, but each school has the opportunity to form their process how they want to do it. So we first formed a steering committee, and I want to thank the members of that steering committee. I co-chaired it with Rebecca Wanzik. Uh, vocational representative was Joe Brewer. Academic representative was Shannon Brisboy. Uh, the other vocational uh, representative was Melanie Chartier, our CTE director, and the other academic uh, representative was Mike Parks, our director of academics. So that was the uh, main steering committee, uh, and uh, Dr. Lincoln Hoker was uh, as a consultant on and off that committee as we went through the process. So what we decided to do was to look at those five standards and we formed five vocational committees and five academic committees. We felt, we felt that at first it was very important for us to have each side of the house view those standards through their own lens so that they could sort of talk with their colleagues within vocational or talk with their colleagues within academic and look at the overall campus, look at the standards, and come to a, a conclusion as to how they viewed, how the school is doing, the students, the instruction. Uh, and then what we ultimately did uh, is those committees came together and they did a crosswalk together. They talked about the different types of evidence and things that they had gathered. Uh, and then ultimately, as a steering committee, we uh, used all that input. They used Google Docs. They identified where they thought things were red, yellow, or green was the color scheme that we gave it. Green meaning that we're doing really well. Yellow is maybe we could be doing better or, or they couldn't find a lot of evidence. Red was these are areas that we feel uh, we should be looking at or we should have more. Yes? Sorry to interrupt you and I, I might have missed this. Um, so the standards are the DESE standards or their NIASC NEASC standards? has their, their own standards. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And how many were, are there? There's five standards for so accreditation. So they say these are the five standards Correct. that we're going to measure your school with. Yes, so they look and at... And then the yep. two different committees, they they each looked at all of five standards, looking for evidence to support or not each of the five standards. So we had a vocational standard that looked at leadership and an academic uh, committee that looked at leadership. So we had a vocational committee that looked at... Uh, like resources yeah. and student supports. Yeah. And then we had the academic looked at those same things with resources and yeah. student supports. We had a vocation that looked at facilities, we had an academic that looked at facilities. So uh, same five standards, correct. two different committees. Were they, um, like when you say resources and facilities, mm -hmm. did the vocational committee stick to the shops and the academic committee stick to the classroom space so, or did they both do the whole campus? They both did the whole campus, but we didn't. We left it up to them to look at the standards. So within the standards, there's principles. Those principles have, uh, like, identifier language that they're going to use to help guide their investigation. So we didn't want to give a lot of top-down uh, how they had to look at it. We wanted to be able to form the committee and allow them to look at it through their lens, however they saw fit. Um, so they looked at, based on those, those principles, which are really like prompts, they're looking at both their classroom space and the overall campus. So they're going, they're going big, they're going small, and then back to big, or micro, macro, micro. So there's kind of this ebb and flow as they're looking at the standards. And the same thing happens whether they're looking at, at uh, curriculum and assessment. It's you're looking at big global things like um, templates and, and um, where is it all located all the way down to what are you actually doing within your subject matter. So it's, it kind of ebbs and flows. Were all that. of the academic departments surveyed and all of the shops or were... So the five academic committees would have been made up of everyone from different departments. Okay. So they opted in. So if somebody said, I really want to focus on the leadership strand, strand, uh, yeah. standard. Others might have said, well, I want to volunteer and focus on curriculum assessment. On that curriculum assessment, it wasn't just English teachers, or it wasn't just right. uh, plumbers. Okay. It would have been an amalgamation of everybody who wanted to go in. So gotcha. it very much was across the, the standards. We also had the paraprofessionals join uh, one of these. And we, we ran these as PLCs. So they were run with a facilitator, mm -hmm. and that was their focus. So, so that's what we did. Everything is self-selected. Is that what I'm hearing you say, or to a great extent? It, to a great extent, it was self-selected, but if we had 
15 people that signed up for one committee and three that signed up for the other. Yeah. We tried to find balance. Yeah. We also looked at it because it, 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 as you go through NEASC, um, you can start to see that some of the standards are a little heavier than others. Mm -hmm. So in the ones that we knew were heavier, uh, they may have had a committee of 12, okay. and one of the ones that might have been lighter had a committee of five or seven. Yeah. Right. So that they could balance out the workload yeah. of what they're investigating and what kind of documentation and evidence they're gathering. Were you doing the leadership of all of this sort of, like, because you're having to fact make all these adjustments, right? Were mm -hmm. you doing that yourself, or was that the, you with the steering committee? So that, that would be the steering committee. Nice. Yep. That's so uh, they were, and each of them were assigned as liaisons, so they were coming in and out of the steering committee, out to the smaller committees, and then coming back. So as the smaller committees were meeting, the steering committee was meeting. And we were generally looking at things that they were going to be doing so that we could have the activity set up or the questions set up. And we were reviewing what they already did. Uh, and I can get more into that. So if you look at this, like, specifically what did we do? December, January, we had the faculty go through the uh, portrait or vision of the graduate protocol. Um, so NIAS calls it vision of the graduate. Other people call it portrait of a graduate. Um, so we went through and we did that protocol. Now the steering committee was trained on that protocol uh, in April of 22. So then we formed, well, what will these activities look like? We pretty much mimicked the smaller, uh, a, a more pared down version of the training we went through so that the staff would go through that. Uh, so they went through and they did that in those two. The Principal's Youth Advisory, I also ran the students through that same protocol. So they went through the same experience. Uh, to help inform that, we did surveys out to parents, students, staff, uh, and we surveyed our program advisories. So they all had input based back up to us on what the vision of the graduates should be. As we went through January to June, that's when they were actually doing a lot of their work. That's when they were investigating, answering questions, going to different contacts within the district. So you might have been on the leadership committee, but you may not know all the policies and protocols. So they were reaching out, people were assigned different things, gathering that information. Uh, what we began to do is, again, we gave them the documents, so all this was through Google Drive, so a lot of this were live documents that we could see as it was going on. Uh, we had everything set up, Mike Parks, our curriculum, uh, our director of academics did most of the uh, template creation for us, uh, but we could see all that stuff. So they were going back, they were unpacking these standards, and they were filling, starting to fill in and answer questions and identifying evidence. So a lot of that evidence was hyperlinked that we could see in real time while we were meeting and see the work that they were doing. Uh, aside from just physically going to their meetings with our liaisons, we could actually see it in virtual world looking just in going into Google and seeing, seeing it as it came. So that's what they worked on through June. Uh, while they were working on all that, the steering committee was taking all that information out of the vision of the graduate. They were uh, pilot compiling it, paring it down, and starting to form it into actual narrative and language. And that's what we were doing, which eventually then went out to the staff for vote, uh, which passed. And then while they were gathering all that evidence, we started packaging up what they were doing. So when we got back in September, the steering committee, what we did is we released all the teachers back to start, we were sort of weaving in two different professional development things. So at the beginning of this year, they were going back in and they were looking at something we had done uh, five, six years ago, which was our curriculum crosswalk for ninth and 10th grade. We wanted to re-familiarize them and with turnover on what that was, they then went on to curriculum walk 11th and 12th grade. So what that is, is all the academics are putting together all the curriculum, sharing it with the vocational teachers so they can see what's happening and what they can embed uh, as part of embedded academics, which is a requirement in chapter 74. So. While they're doing that, we're taking all the different standards and we're starting to form uh, those reports, which we did. And then through September to January, all that stuff got gathered up, got written, got voted on. Uh, and then you can go to the next slide. So what did we actually share with the team? So what we gathered, when the team came, we, we, we first shared with them a lot of quick facts about Smith Vocational, about the community, about the catchment area, about the the programs that we have here. Uh, we created the standard reports. Each of the 15 shops created a program narrative. There's a template you get from the ASK. So they did all that. 
Uh, we compiled all the different reports that they asked and the requested evidence. What we did is we formed uh, Google folders that they could just go in and see. Uh, plus you have to upload certain things right into the NIAS portal. They have an electronic portal. Some of the other things that we highlighted, because NIASC is really comes every 10 years in vocational, which I wasn't used to. Uh, they may come every two, every five. They're here, they've been coming through a lot more than when I was at a non-vocational high school, um, which would have really just been the 10 years. But in, in vocational world, there's sometimes a two-year follow-up and then a five-year mid-cycle, and they come in with a, a smaller team. Why? And they go through. Uh, I think it's they're looking at safety, they're looking at facilities, they're looking at outcomes. So that's just how they did it on the CTE side. We highlighted some of the staff changes, positive, negatives, and substantive changes over the last 10 years. Uh, what did the actual visit look like? It, it, it looked like us as a steering committee welcoming that team. It was a team of, uh, it ended up being eight members. It was supposed to be nine, one wasn't able to make it, but eight individuals. Uh, and they were teachers, two principals um, that came, and they went through and looked at, at everything. Um, we had, the two principals were both from Connecticut. They were CTE principals, uh, and then we had an animal science representative and a carpentry representative. The other five members were various academics. What we then did is we had them tour the campus. We all know this is quite a campus to walk around and get used to. So we had four students that toured them around. I just wanted to highlight them. Uh, Jayana Daniels, senior. Chris Alexander, junior. Josie DeBay, senior. Dominic Sanchez, sophomore. And Dominic's one of our, our student reps. Um, but it, they did an amazing job. They were like the hit of the, hit of the, of the day, of course. Uh, but they brought them all around and were able to do all that. That was followed by the team going in and visiting classes. Now when you have six, seven team members going through classrooms, I had to create a, a two-day um, schedule for them. Uh, but they were going in for about 10 to 15 minutes in all these different classrooms. They pretty much saw every single classroom on campus. So they were th through every space in an hour and a half. Uh, they then conducted a series of, of interviews. They, some of them were split into groups, some of them were like two halves, uh, and some were just all together. So who did they interview? They interviewed five administrators, six department heads, six teachers, uh, 17 students, uh, eight representatives, which are really, you know, their faculty still, and the school nurse. Uh, they interviewed Dr. Lincoln Hoker and Ms. Fairman. They interviewed six parents. Uh, and then they really delved in and looked at all the different documents and policies that we supplied them with, as well as evidence and examples of student work. Uh, and then they did a steering committee debrief exit meeting. Uh, and this was Tuesday and Wednesday of last week. So what did the vision of the graduate? I just want to share this with the, this is something that eventually will replace the mission statement that gets read at our meetings. This becomes sort of the new mission <coughs> statement, the vision of the graduate. And that's Smith Vocation Agriculture High School graduates are confident, diverse individuals who are professional and self-aware. They work to positively impact their industry and community through inspirational team-focused leadership effective communication, and moral decision-making. So at the end of the day, what do we want a Smith Vocational graduate to be? That's really what that, that protocol comes. And uh, when in talking with our parents, students, staff, and industry partners, this is the, these are the adjectives that dominated the responses that we got. So we then formed them into a narrative. Now, when you see this, it will get packaged. It actually gets broken down into three different sections around communicator, uh, around professional, and around um, community member. And so we have additional language for that too. And then that'll get, we're gonna work with graphics to come up with, uh, you know, a visual depiction of what that is. Yes? Can you say a little bit more about the, um, I am hearing what you're, how you're describing the process of mm -hmm. not only the protocol, and I never was a high school teacher, so I never went through the NIAS accreditation process. Um, when I see a vision of a graduate or a portrait of a graduate, mm -hmm. um, I think of all of a, of a district um, community stakeholders contributing to that. So this seems really educator driven um, and, and the educated in terms of the students. And um, I'd like, you know, I, I'm thinking 
we, of course, we want parents and families and community members and, and obviously industry um, representatives. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about their contribution, like the outside of Smith Folk um, contributors to the crafting of the vision of the graduate statement. Uh, the, the outsiders that we did were employers, were colleges, were members of the advisory. That's who we went to. And so like, were they surveyed or interviewed or? <coughs> they were surveyed. Surveyed. Yep. Okay. Do you know how many, um, or how many responses there were? I don't have that. Okay. No. No, but I can get it for you. Okay. Yep. Just, just curious, because I do feel like it's important for them to contribute. No objection yeah. to all of the educator work and, and phenom phenomenal. What a process. So the next thing that we're asked to do is really to look at the standards and present back what we think are strengths. This is what came out of those committees as highlighted as strengths. Um, so this is what we, we shared. So uh, you can see the language is, is kind of around us taking both the standard of NEASC and melding it with some examples of what we're doing here at Smith Vocational. Um, so standard one is about leadership. So they're talking about uh, that's any type of leadership. That's just not administrators. Uh, so you can see that it really what highlighted some some key things that came out of the committees and from. Oh, and the other thing is I I, I failed to mention uh, with NEASC you have to do uh, they have a, a <coughs> created survey that's specifically their survey that goes to parents, students, and staff. So all that information was gathered and. That was part of, of all the, the evidence that we used to look at all that. So here's some examples uh, of things we do. If you want to go to the next. <clears throat> so standard two, we're talking here about the student learning experience. We're talking about assessment curriculum. Will we get copies of the standard two you have you have the packet. Okay. You have the entire yes. self reflection. Yep. It's phenomenal uh, to see about fifty all pages. All that evidence. Yeah. Just summarized so in, in a way that's so easy to digest. And and this is just summarizing. In there you'll see the larger yeah. write up. And this is about student support, so library and guidance and other ones, that's standard four. Standard five is about your facilities. Uh, one of the things that I do want to highlight, um, <clears throat> so what we're waiting on now is we are going to get back uh, a preliminary report. The reports look different now. So it used to be that you got this giant written report. <clears throat> it would take you so much time to read through it, and then you'd have, to, you'd have time to rebut, accept or rebut a lot of the things that, that are said. Right now what we're getting is a bulleted response, and they're looking at only the language in the NIAS standards. So that's what they're going to focus on. They're going to say, you have hit the following language. We feel you need to work on the following language. So it's kind of how they're breaking it down. Um, what I will say around the facilities, only because we all know about Smith Book, we all know about the facilities, how old they are, and, and the amount of time that it takes, and, and all the hard work with the custodians and students uh, to really improve and maintain the facilities. Uh, they really kind of looked at it as, hey, the facilities are what they are, which is different than the experience we've gotten with NEASC 10 years. Uh, I think they've kind of resigned themselves to saying it is what it is. What they really want to focus more on is, what are we doing to ensure that the facilities are safe and maintained? As, as opposed to what they used to be focused on was, what are you doing to get new facilities? So I think there's been a shift uh, kind of above us, I think, with a lot of the arguments that we've made, that the board's made, that Dr. Lincolnhoker's made. Uh, he talks about it being like the Fenway Park, uh, and we're sitting here trying, we're not going to tear it down and rebuild necessarily, because we may not be able to, but we're going to do everything we can to modernize it. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we're focused on. How do you feel about that shift in their um, emphasis? Are you happy about it? Yes. Yeah. I think it's more pragmatic at this point. Does it mean that they're taking off or that we should take off a, a, a goal of trying to replace the facilities? No, but I think it's pragmatic uh, in the sense that, and realistic, that that's what is in our control, so focus on what's in your control right now. What did we identify as priority areas? So one of the things you have to come out is priority areas, and then it, we are expected over the next two years to draft a growth plan focused on the NEAS priority areas. Eventually they would get woven into 
our um, school improvement plan, our district plan also. Uh, so what are we looking at? Well, one of the things is when you create a new vision statement, right, the, the, when we create that new vision of the graduate, that's different than what we have had. Uh, and, and one of the things that we really need to do is drive that down into all of our decision making. If we say that that's in the industry members say that's what they believe in and that's what we believe in, then we really got to make sure that that exists. So things like, believe it or not, when it talks about, uh, like I said before, we break it down into three different categories around professionalism, communication, and others. It's saying, you really drill it down and you say, okay, as a communicator, to be that effective communicator, moral driven uh, communicator, it's what are we doing then with the resources we're buying? What are we doing in plumbing and electrical and ag mech and English and history? What activities are we doing that are cultivating communication? So really I like the idea of it. I think it's pretty empowering is trying to push that down to the books that we're buying, the things that we're doing, the activities that we're doing and saying, if that's what we say students are supposed to do when they leave here after four years, then what are we doing to train them to do that by the time they leave? So I do like that. So you'll see a lot of it focuses in on that. Um, we, we felt that we do a good job here. Uh, we really didn't list it because we felt uh, that we're failing. It was kind of one of those things with the staff that everybody was in agreement that we can always do better Which and we should focus to do better. The English language learners. Yeah, ELO and 504s and yeah. special needs. That we should, we should always be focused on improving what we can do for those groups. So it was kind of one of those things where we feel like we're doing good, but there's such an important group of students that we don't want to sit here and say, we got it, we got that. So I think I, I, I felt good hearing from the staff and others that this is an area that we want to say, let's, let's keep that as a focus of what we're driving for. Uh, and then standard five, obviously, um, it's we felt that we really got to focus on making sure that our buildings, our facilities can deliver the high quality curriculum for our programs. And if there's any other questions. So it was a year and a half long process. It was a lot of effort by the staff. I'm very proud of what they were able to do. And um, you know, it, it, we are where we're at now. We'll take the, the response from NEASC and, and we'll form our plans moving out. What does <coughs> ELC stand for, Joe? You mentioned that. Yeah, it's a professional learning community. So you really think of it as um, colleague working groups. Gotcha. Out of curiosity. Yes. Uh, who are the two principals from the CTE from Connecticut? Just in case I need to put a word in for you all. Richard Shellman. Okay. I don't know if you know him. Uh, I don't know the other gentleman's name. But I'll get it for you. Um, yeah. Joe, will you pass on to the team? The other one. Shushan. Shushan. Shushan didn't come, I think. I think he was with the Cabal check. Will you pass on to the team what a great job they did here? Absolutely. And I know, being around as many years as they have with me asking yeah. some of the stuff in the past as compared to the future, this is light years ahead of what we used to do in regards to getting them to recognize. Mm. You know, like our cover page says 1908, and here we are. And uh, somebody asked me today about, you know, uh, here at the table up there in our construction meeting that what would Oliver Smith think about the school and the building and everything we're doing mm -hmm. and I said he'd be proud of us you know we've come a long way yeah. and the kind of work that's being done here academically as far as the instructors as far as keeping the campus up to snuff the best we can can't work any harder no. Please, please thank you. I will, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Just to help, uh, yes. so I know there were a lot of questions coming from from doctor over there on the other side of the table. So the reflection report, yeah. this report, yeah. will list the standards out for you. Yeah, great. Uh, which is a good, it's a good yeah. read. So yeah. if you have time, it will at least give you a sense of the principles of which will yeah. fall under each of the standards. Great. Thank you. Um, I've asked you this before, and I want to ask you now that you're just on the other side of this process. Um, the value of going through it on a scale of 1 to 10, what would you say and why? To, um, from your professional perspective. Only. I, I don't know if I feel... 
I don't know if I could. I what feel that I can rate it from one to ten okay, or not. So um, I think that I think that any process that makes a school and staff reflect on what they're doing and have to look at themselves as if they're outsiders, mm -hmm. and then open yourself up uh, to critical feedback from colleagues. So you have uh, people, and we, we knew we knew a lot of them, um, the ones from Massachusetts. So to kind of sit there and say, okay, well, we're going to allow you now to give us feedback and judge us. Uh, I think is very healthy. I think if you, if we get defensive and close ourselves off to that kind of a thing, um, there's going to be a lot of takeaways that we're going to miss. It doesn't mean that we're going to accept everything they say, uh, because we have our own idiosyncrasies, we have our own issues or problems or habits and and policies and protocols. And a lot of times, those are grown out of real things. Like they exist for a reason. Uh, but it's a, it's always a good process. And I think. From our perspective, uh, you know, we've boiled that process in because we do academic and vocational cycle reviews. So every single program and shop goes through review every five years internally. Uh, they're on a schedule. So whether it's English and math or whether it's um, ag mech and carpentry, they go through that. So we've built that into it. So I, I, I do think it's valuable, very valuable. You talked about the curriculum class swap, uh, grades mm -hmm. 9 to 10 and 11 to 12. Um, and those are great opportunities for professional collaboration. Did you, this year and a half process, and to be continued, that mm -hmm. must have really fostered the same kind of collaboration, those relationships, would you say, like a community building kind of yeah. work? Or? I think it always has that effect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Um, yes, sir. Greatly <coughs> prepared package here, uh, Joe, and the school and community summary quickly stand over that. Information here is, is um, priceless in a sense, and how it's you're so dynamic and, and not taking a static approach to anything and always looking to improve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, the next item we have uh, there's no student reps tonight, correct? Correct. Uh, I do want to announce that um, Brandon Diaz did resign. Um, and uh, I do have a replacement, Phoebe Perez, and she'll be at the next meeting. Great. Awesome. Thank you. She's from Electrical. Good evening, everybody. Uh, could I offer a, a comment from the peanut gallery? <laughs> <laughs> Hell of a lot different than when I graduated from Smith Boat in 1957. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to ask that, uh, I'm talking to the chair prior to, uh, you know, we are not in a position to formally vote on the budget this year, uh, this evening. Uh, but what I'm, I'm hoping to do is go through the traditional superintendent report, I'll then go into the budget presentation, have any discussion with the budget by all means. Uh, so sort of rolling the two reports into one. So the, the more traditional superintendent report under instructional leadership. Just a few highlights. Uh, I was part of a, a mass hire clean energy sector presentation a few weeks ago, uh, and now there's a, a follow-up meeting that's occurring in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the idea behind this, I, I think the state under the new state administration is looking at uh, this void in clean energy, uh, whether it's solar or whatnot and uh, what can the state do to invest in that particular industry. And they're specifically looking at the vocational schools, whether it's Chapter 74 programs, i.e. electrical as one example, uh, or through the adult ed programs in the evening, how do we train uh, the adults uh, in the community to, to pursue some of these jobs that aren't even created yet. Uh, so uh, just letting the board know, you know, there's some conversations. I know Mass Hire, uh, Hamden County Mass Hire, and as, as a reminder, we are in Hampshire County, we, sort of align with the, the Franklin uh, Hampshire County Mass Hire, but Hamden County Mass Hire is the one driving this and we've been invited to the table, so uh, more to come. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Wansick. Uh, prior to the NEAC visit, we had the uh, ADESI team out here uh, with the tiered focus monitoring review. Uh, so similar concept that the state comes in, they, they have certain regulations and expectations. It's more special ed focused around policy and whatnot, many interviews. Uh, so that occurred in, in early March. Uh, so again, thank you to, to Ms. Wanzik for that leadership to, to make sure that that happens. 
I always love, uh, on March 6th, we had our annual mock interview day. Uh, unfortunately, Mother Nature was not a big supporter of us this year. This was the, the third reschedule, uh, but we were finally able to have the mock interviews. Do we have a copy of this? Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. All right, sorry. I keep looking. Sorry. Yeah. There's one more. Take a moment. No problem. So this year I had the opportunity to uh, fill in as an interviewer for the Culinary and the Inclusion Repair. And, uh, I followed up with the, the culinary instructors afterwards. I was highly impressed uh, by the, those particular students. They were prepared, they came with a resume, uh, they answered uh, every single question with personal examples. They asked me questions, which was great. Uh, not too many students will ask questions at the end. I think that's uh, a big home run when it comes to interviewing skills. So, again, I applaud uh, Max Wider and the guidance team uh, organizing the mock interviews. Again, I think the weather never really helped us out, but it was a great, great morning. Were there enough um, interviewers? Yes. And uh, about what proportion were outside from the school? Oh, the vast majority. I don't think there was too many school Fantastic. personnel there. Great, because that Step really up. adds to the value of the experience. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, March 15th, and I, I won't steal the thunder from Dr. Spencer Robinson, uh, but we did have our, our latest policy subcommittee meeting, and we continued to review the library materials policy. And we started to get into longevity uh, and what that would look like potentially here. So, again, I'll, I'll leave the details to you. Uh, and again, thank you to Mr. Bianca and his leadership in, in organizing and making sure that the, the NAAC accreditation visit uh, went as smoothly as possible. Uh, from my standpoint, just a couple observations. Uh, everything that the board said is, is true. Uh, you know, the steering committee, Mr. Bianca, did a great job. I think the staff did a wonderful job with all of the, the committee work. Uh, you know, my former life, like Mr. Bianca, having the, the, the traditional high school experience, um, it, it has changed. So back then, it was truly the visiting team would show up on a Sunday. There would be a very large dog and pony show happening on that Sunday. Then the, they were in the school Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, then they left. Uh, this year, they showed up Tuesday morning and left Wednesday, so it's truly a 48 hour uh, experience. Uh, so that was scaled back. Uh, and, and the other change, Mr. Bianco was talking about the five standards, I mean, that's consistent you know, no matter the type of high school. The only difference was, uh, and Joe alluded to it, the shop specific reviews. So every single Chapter 74 program had their own report. And I think that goes back to what Mr. Bianco was talking about. Those follow up visits really focusing on the safety uh, and, and the operations of every single program. So that was some additional work that you know, we had to do that a traditional high school may not have to. Uh, but otherwise, uh, Overall, I think it was a good experience. I think the feedback that we're going to get uh, will be very positive for the school moving forward. And then lastly, another highlight uh, as we enter the spring season uh, is sort of the unofficial kickoff to all different kinds of events and activities. Uh, it's always nice to, to attend the Health Technology CNA ceremony. Uh, so the students, these are juniors in the Health Technology program. Uh, they have finally finished the CNA curriculum, that particular program. They have not sat yet for the exam, but you know, past uh, past practice, past history tells us that they uh, are very successful when they do safety exams. So it's nice to see them you know, make it that far. Under management and operations, <clears throat> on the 21st of March, um, the city capital improvement plan hearing uh, occurred. I, I was luckily I was able to sit home and watch it on Zoom. Uh, I was highly impressed, honestly, uh, with just how the whole meeting ran. I, I want to thank the mayor. I think it went really well. Thank you for being there. Nothing, nothing official. Mr. Smith was going to have all the answers, but we avoided any, any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're just waiting for official word, but hopefully there'll be some positive news coming out to, to support the school. Uh, speaking of obviously major issues that we have, can I ask how, how does that process work? So typically in the fall, uh, each department is asked to submit uh, projects that they want to have supported through the capital improvement. Is that multi-year? How, how, um, how, how do you know how much money is available? Or do we you don't know? know. Okay, so do you have a ballpark number that you try to you, So it could be from uh, $10 to $10 million? No, 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 this is stipulation. <laughs> uh, so as far as NPS or support certification goes, uh, these particular projects, as long as they're under 150000 
they can be applied to net school spending, okay. which makes it easier for the city side. Right. So typically the projects that we're looking at submitting are capped at the $150,000. And those have to be above $10,000, and they need to um, either extend the life of something for 10 years or, or it would be something that the buying capital needs to have at least a 10 year lifespan. Okay. And we can submit, we could submit as many as we wanted to? So there's a five year plan? It's a five year annually recurring plan. So it's every year the plan shifts a year. And so, so you plan out for five years and then every year you look and say, we ask the departments to prioritize what are your top priorities. Mm -hmm. And then you write them, and then you look at what the available funds, and sometimes things move and shift, and sometimes things come on that weren't expected because that's the way capital works. From all departments. Yes. And how is this funded? It is funded from many sources. So um, it's funded from stabilization, from um, undesignated fund balance, from our capital stabilization that we've been building for years. Um, it's funded by grants sometimes. It's um, it's available online if you want to take a look at it and, and you can see all the funding sources and where it's coming from. Do, do you, uh, is there consideration given to like equity in terms of distribution among the departments? Like, how, like if all these different departments are saying this is a top priority for me, who decides that these departments' top priorities get the funding and these don't? So there's a committee that um, consists of a city councilor, someone from uh, the planning board, a, a Northampton uh, Home School School Committee member, and three members of the public. And so they, that's who the superintendent was saying, um, uh, we, well, not that. We present about in the fall. We present in the fall. Mm -hmm. They, each department presents to that committee. Okay. And then they make recommendations to me, and then the finance director and I sit down and we move stuff around and try and figure out how many things that we can possibly fund. And then there, it's a very collaborative process. So we're often going back to the departments and saying, you know, what, um, can you tell me more about this? Can we push this a little? Is this, this looks actually like maybe it's a higher priority than what you indicated. Um, so it's, it's a very, it's a months long process. That's I guess awesome to other. understand. Thank yeah. you. Well, one last question. How is the maximum, how's, how is the maximum amount of the fund determined? Like, uh, so if there's all these, is it totally dependent, it's like these sources, however much that? It's yeah. available funds. Yeah, okay. so it depends. So it's those, those identified sources of funding, yep. whatever those numbers are, whatever and they are to, that's your okay. is part of that. Um, okay. And it also includes all the, the DPW, mm -hmm. but those are from the enterprise funds, so it's all of those mm -hmm. funds, and then all the identified sources that we have been building these reserves, and we mm -hmm. we try and very carefully use gotcha. them each year, and not use too much, yeah. um, so that we maintain the ability to fund capital projects every year. So it sounds it's kind of like a fungible process. It's to yeah. an extent. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of moving yeah. parts, and the finance director does a remarkable job of Tracking piecing it all, all together and trying to figure out how how we can fund the maximum amount of projects awesome. possible. Thank you. Um, and so central, like the bulk of the projects come from central services, but it'll be central services for the schools, central right. services right. for the different departments, right. for the buildings. Right. Right. So when, how do you determine what? what um, requests are going to be made or, um, to the... So we talked with our internal team here, with the administrative team, okay. uh, keeping an eye on what we are uh, projecting out. Mm -hmm. uh, as the mayor said, sometimes the priorities that we set last year for this year, they change. Um, prime example, even within the year, things change. So what we were presenting in the fall, it changed from what was presented at the city council. Uh, and I thank the mayor for that flexibility. So what did we present? So I, when we were talking about the horticulture building, what I said, when I asked about the um, the generator and the electrical panel, you picked up what I was putting down, yes. and then those uh, ended up making it on the capital program. Along with uh, a multifunction bus, along with, I actually got that. And I don't know how many years the bus had been on the program. Correct. That's one that's. Our storage buildings that you see along the pasture, mm -hmm. uh, some roof repair needs there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Apple storage building that we had some work done over the last couple of years, uh, residing that particular building. Uh, D building, our infamous roof issue uh, to try to secure that roof. Is that less than $150,000? Yes. 
Really? Uh, and that's not region. It's not the whole. It's just repair. It's just repairing. It's repairing. repairing. It's repairing. 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 Um, and as the mayor said, the generator and the electrical paneling for the new construction. Awesome. So those are the items that we've, we submitted. Thank you so much. And what are we, are we going to get them all funded? I don't know yet. Okay. So the, the city council mm -hmm. will have their final vote next. Okay. So we'll pay attention to that. Right. Fingers and toes awesome. are crossed. Yeah. Yes. Right. Thank you. That's very illuminating. I did not understand how that process worked. Right. And again, thank you. Uh, it's a great process. Yeah. Enjoy the one thing that's nice is when we're awarded, um, uh, the city finance director yeah. Sherman, will reach out to us and say, okay, these funds you can use now, okay. or there these funds you you can begin using July one. Okay. So at least we can start preparing. Thank you. Okay. So moving on to the horticultural building, just a few updates. Uh, one is, as the board knows, uh, we've agreed to accept the 1.2 million from the EEA. Uh, I just want to have a brief conversation with the board. Um, through conversations with the EEA and, and the Assistant Secretary and, and the uh, representative from DCR kind of overseeing all of this, uh, there was a proposal that was given to me uh, really last minute, to be honest. Uh, this notion of uh, having a, a demonstration harvest at our demonstration forest. So the concept would be through the bidding process, we would hire a general contractor who would then oversee hiring a professional harvester to do a harvest of some of our, our trees up at the, the forest as an educational opportunity for our students, obviously. Uh, we would then take those trees and we would uh, send them off for processing. And obviously the students would be exposed uh, to see that whole process happen. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we would obviously have some lumber that we could then use with the horticulture building. Uh, the, the request was uh, that finished lumber we would use in the building. If we had any excess lumber, we would use it in cabinet making and or carpentry. And if we still had excess lumber, uh, the state would take it and use it elsewhere. Uh, so I think it's a great idea in theory. In addition to this, uh, they wanted us to uh, create a three-part educational video series. The folks from EDA. Okay. That's one of the so stipulations. They said, they said we would like to see this as part of you. Like, is it a requirement? What? Okay. Okay. So they were uh, part of the the package was uh, us producing a three-part educational video series uh, that we could get educate uh, with the ministry. Uh, there was going to be a requirement once the project was done, we were going to submit for this national award program that they're familiar with. Uh, we were going to then open up the building for an open house for a professional architect association to come through and look at uh, using local uh, uh, products, what, what it could look like. Uh, I think that was about it. So this all happened actually on the, day, the same day as the career fair. Uh, and there was a million and one emails and then schedules and people were already being invited and it was a lot very quickly. Uh, and I had some initial concerns. So I, I, I spoke with our SMMA team uh, and they shared the same concerns. Uh, the concern is multifaceted. One was we are already at the 12th hour to get this project out to bid and build this project. Uh, this potentially could delay that whole process. Uh, the concern is, as a school, you know, we have scheduling, and, and how do we make this work within the school to make it truly educationally uh, viable? I don't know how that would happen. Meaningful. Yeah. Uh, the cost. So we would be responsible to hire this, you know, the harvester. You know, what would that cost be? Uh, I got to be both from that. Uh, I think their vision was yes, we would be responsible to pay for that professional harvester. Uh, however, if we're harvesting our own lumber, maybe the savings on the material, since it's our own material, we're not going out and buying that retail. So maybe there'd be a cost savings that would cover the cost of harvesting. Okay, that's a vision. I don't know if that would be real or not. Um, so <clears throat> I talked to the SMM18, and, and we actually all agreed on uh, a rebuttal, which I'm getting to. Uh, but I, I told the, uh, the representatives from EEA, I said, I cannot make the decision. Okay, within my lane, I don't have that authority. The board has the authority for such a project. And we had a meeting this evening. Uh, so I said, chances are somebody at the board would have a question. 
Um, what happens if the board says, no, we don't want to have a large-scale demonstration of the, the demonstration boards. We don't want to cut down as many trees. Uh, what happens if we say, no, we're not ready for this? Would we lose the money? And the response was, no, we would not lose the money. The $1.2 million is still allocated to the school. Uh, obviously, the, the trade-off is we just simply have to buy the water rather than producing the water. Uh, so I, I share that with the board that um, you know, my recommendation is that we don't necessarily go down this path right now. Um, SMMA's response, and I really liked it, and we talked about it within the building community earlier today, is that we acknowledge that there may be, hopefully, a second phase to this building project. Uh, as you all remember, we, we scaled back the building project, we cut out the additional classroom, cut out the head house, and cut out the new greenhouse. Uh, and the hope is someday, if we find that money tree, we can you know, finish that building project, and then we can demo what we have as an existing uh, structure. Uh, I've already had the conversations with EEA, I think I shared it with the board, that there's a, a potential opportunity to talk about a conservation restriction of the same property. And it would be a, a financial transaction that would occur to apply that, that restriction to the property. That money could be used to hopefully you know, finish this project. During that phase, this would make a lot of sense during that phase. If we're going to apply a, a conservation restriction to the forest, perhaps we do the demonstration harvest, and we can use some of that, uh, the lumber and that addition. Uh, so I think we're all on the same page within the SMMA team, myself, I shared that with the, the building committee. There is definitely support within the building committee to be totally transparent. I think people saw the value and you know this is a great opportunity, uh, but we also realize that uh, we need to go out to bid next Tuesday uh, and, and it's just it's way too big of a conversation. So I share that with the board. Uh, I would recommend that we, uh, I tell EEA thank you, it's a great idea, but let's pause that for the next phase. Um, uh, so that, that's part of that EEA uh, conversation that's been happening. I just want to make a note, it is on your agenda uh, later uh, this evening. There's a, a letter that uh, SMMA has drafted that outlines the proprietary requests. Uh, I will talk about that letter in detail and I can answer any questions when we get to that agenda. But that's part of that letter is as a, a byproduct as a result of the EEA 1.2 so we'll get to that after a little while. Some other updates in regards to the building project. Uh, on March 6th, we had a uh, sit in front of the state plumbing board for a variance. Uh, we were asking for one less staff bathroom, and uh, we were able to get that variance granted. So uh, that de definitely saves on some of the design and construction costs. So that was some good news. Uh, on March 14th, uh, I came back from a MAVA meeting. I, I went with uh, Helen, uh, with Rachel from North, uh, Berkshire, Berkshire design. design, thank you. And uh, with Greg Wilber, our, our OPM, we sat in front of the Northampton Planning Board and uh, we had the site plan approved, uh, which is great news as well. So it's another hurdle that we've gotten, uh, gotten over. Uh, as I already mentioned, we had a building committee meeting earlier today. Uh, great news. Uh, really, the best news is the next bullet. Uh, we, we received the 75% CD estimate. It came back late last night. Uh, the estimate right now is at 5.9 million that you see there. Uh, when you include uh, the soft costs, uh, which is approximately 1.2 million, uh, we are still within budget. Uh, and when I say budget, that's what we have for available revenue sources plus the 1.2 million from the state. Uh, so we are in very good shape as far as I'm moving forward. And that estimate includes, as you can see in the slide, uh, the full radiant floor heat system. Uh, so a few months ago we were talking about uh, we don't have enough money for the radiant floor heat. But since we have to pour a slab anyways, uh, you know, the, the flooring, let's put the plumbing into the concrete and then down the road we can uh, complete the system. We felt uh, the radiant floor heat was worthwhile. We wanted to get that into the estimate. And uh, this estimate includes the entire system. So when the building is complete, we will have operating radiant floor heat. Um, so it's supposed to be five months? Yes. So, any questions on the building project? And again, I'm sure we're going to get to the Maybe we can talk more about it if necessary. Yeah, when we, yeah, well, yeah. You're breathing some sighs of relief. Yes, yeah, he's, he's sleeping bit. at night. Mm -hmm. um, there's other stuff going on, but you know, of course. we'll get through this, this piece. Nature of the beast. Uh, so family and community engagement. Uh, I just want to again quickly <coughs> highlight the March newsletter that went out. Uh, the main focus this month, uh, from, from my perspective, was on um, IRCs industry-recognized credentials. I, I think this is 
a move that is very, very important when it comes to Chapter 74 programs. You know, we talk about the vision of the graduate, you know, what do our graduates have when they go out to the real world. Uh, tangibly, our students are walking away with certificates uh, that hopefully would save employers money for training uh, and it's giving skill sets and sort of a leg up for the, for the students when they enter the workforce with these certifications. So I talked about the value of that from the school perspective, the student perspective, but also the employer perspective. And then, again, uh, I want to thank Mr. McGonaghy for his, his input and in various highlights. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I just see it here, uh, Scott Kiter uh, from the community. Uh, he was recognized at a wonderful article uh, in, uh, I think, with Business West. And uh, he's on our advisory. Uh, he was actually uh, the, the executive sponsor for the recent Atlanta Five. Uh, he gives a, a lot back to the community. He's a great uh, asset to the school. So, uh, so what else are the other typical highlights for the, for the newsletter? Such a great um, communication tool. So, <clears throat> Senator Comerford, I, I want to take a moment and talk a little bit about this. And, uh, so back in February, late February, uh, Dr. Spencer Robinson and I had a follow-up meeting uh, with Senator Comerford. Uh, I say a follow-up, we had an initial meeting December. December um, the notion is, as we all know, debuilding, we need to address debuilding at some point. I would say sooner than later. And if we don't address the building, that's going to create other decisions that have to be made by the board, which I'll get into probably with the budget discussion. Um, but we know funding a new building is very complicated anyways, and it, it's more complicated when we have our, our governance. And it's sort of intertwined. Uh, so I, I do thank Dr. Spencer Robinson for, for creating these initial meetings with the senator. Uh, the senator has been great as far as big picture, kind of looking at pointing us in different directions. Uh, I'm not sure what the solution is. Okay, I have ideas, and um, we've talked about this in, in our vision work as a board, uh, but I do just pose it to the board that at some point, you know, right now, honestly, the horticulture building is my top priority. Uh, that's what I'm living and breathing right now, and obviously a budget and just operating in a school. But big picture, we cannot avoid the discussion of what we do with the building, uh, whether that is um, governance, structure change, uh, whether that is how do we fund it, you know, working with the city, or whether it's we can't tackle that and you know, we have to make some other decisions at the board. Uh, you know, what I'm alluding to is programming and you know just how do we make how do we long term how can we make our budget sustainable long term. You know, and we're hitting I call I told the faculty uh, many districts are having the fiscal cliff Okay, and you, you open up the newspaper any day and you see, you know, in other school districts going over that fiscal cliff. Uh, I think what we're facing right now is not necessarily a fiscal cliff. We'll talk about this in the budget. It's more of a fiscal wall. Okay, uh, we just can't go anymore uh, unless something drastic changes. Um, so that conversation ties back to deep building and ties back to the budget. So uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Spencer Robinson for some of the initial work, uh, but I do think we're at a crossroads where. Uh, I think we both agree that it, it needs to be a, a full board discussion and next step. So I'll just share that to, to share. It, okay. Um, just a side note, not a side note, but um, in late February I was invited to uh, the subcommittee work for the TMC. I'm on the TMC, which is the Tournament Management Committee for the Statewide Athletic Association. And I don't want to get into the weeds here, but uh, it's an opportunity for me to advocate for, for vocational schools in general. And the issue at hand is uh, the state realigns the schools in each of the sports uh, on a periodic basis, typically based on enrollment. That's how you are aligned to a certain division. Division one schools are the big schools. Division five schools are the, the smallest schools. Um, but there's an opportunity when a school is aligned into a new division, there is an appeal process. So if schools feel like, you know, uh, you know, we've been assigned to Division Three, but there's no way we can compete in Division Three. we have rational reasons why, we can try to appeal to go down. The problem with the appeals is it's very subjective. And uh, it's, the vocational school specifically, uh, we were sort of harmed uh, with this new model. Uh, so to have a, a vocational voice within the subcommittee, I think, is very important for us. Uh, and, and I'm talking about participation rates. Uh, you heard from Mr. Leroux about a month ago about our co-op numbers. You know, this is a great thing. Our co-op numbers are going through the roof. Uh, but when our co-op numbers go up, 
we are apt to lose some students who may not want to come back to school to participate in athletics because they're out in co-op. So even though our enrollment is going up, is our participation level as high? Uh, so we're talking about a lot of things. Uh, again, not to get into the weeds, but it's, it's just a great opportunity for us to have a seat at the table. I want to thank uh, Mr. Clark, our new assistant principal. He's taken over the Students of the Month luncheon uh, initiative. We had our first luncheon uh, earlier this year, March 1st. It went really well. You know, the chance to recognize several students for all of the hard work is, is always nice. And I want to thank the culinary program here for putting out a great lunch for them. So that was nice. Uh, the Arrival 5 uh, on March 6th, I was hesitant, I'll be honest, uh, on how this particular program would go uh, here at the school and uh, last minute planning. And I cannot say enough about the school. Uh, I think the planning and the organization uh, that happened, obviously the food and the students that were there serving the food, uh, it was a great evening to really showcase the school. Uh, and I heard nothing but positive feedback from the, from the chamber. So if I could just touch on that. Claire Kelly, who was uh, one of the key people that helped set that event up from the Chamber of Commerce, personally wrote notes to Andy, myself, and uh, people that uh, set everything up. She has never seen an event like that. And I want to comment on the gifts that were given away that night on the raffle uh, from business cards that the carpentry department, my goodness, uh, the, the awards, the, the gifts that were given away, people were just pulled over. And so we got a lot of high marks on that event. Uh, it worked out great for the public uh, PR, as well as uh, we had 125 people that attended that evening. So it was uh, possibly 75 that never had seen or been inside Smith School. So I thought uh, it was a great event and just wanted to touch on that and let them know that the chamber was uh, really thought it was awesome, awesome. Thank you. On March 7th, the following morning, uh, so our poor, poor custodial staff having to set up the Rabbit 5, tear it down, and be ready the next morning for the career fair in the gymnasium. You see the photo that was on Facebook highlighting this. Uh, just a side note from the career fair, uh, there was two individuals representing their own companies. Uh, I actually grew up and went to high school with these two individuals. Uh, one of them, not to me directly, so they were not a biased feedback, uh, but spoke to the other individual who then spoke to me. Uh, this first individual was at a, a career fair for another school a few weeks prior to, and was blown away with our particular career fair. Uh, much better organized, laid out, more employers, uh, just top to bottom, a top notch event. So, um, again, I want to thank the staff uh, that participated, got the students through, the students were prepared, uh, they were engaged. Uh, so, another great opportunity for our students to get in front of employers. Thank uh, Mr. Bianca on the 8th. Uh, we had Aspen Property Management here for a tour, uh, and then I participated in, in the lunch. Um, but Aspen Property Management, uh, they are owned by Harold Grinspoon. Uh, if that name rings a bell, he's out of Long Meadow. Uh, the Grinspoon Awards, and the, the excellence in teaching uh, that I know Smith Book participates in, I'm assuming Northampton participates in as well. Uh, so what they were looking for is, you know, trying to build this partnership with the school. Uh, knowing that we have all these different trade areas, uh, they are always looking for uh, you know, skilled labor, uh, whether it's carpentry or electrician or plumbing or whatnot, and how can we build that, that pipeline uh, for future employees. I cannot reference how many rental properties they have in the Pioneer Valley, but it's, it's a lot. So uh, we'll see where that partnership goes. Do you know if they already partnered with Putnam? I do not know. They have not. We would be there first. That's interesting. On the 15th, uh, I participated in the annual St. Patrick's Committee breakfast. Uh, and I applaud the mayor. Great job. Okay. <laughs> Took a little ribbing. <laughs> comes with a job. That weekend, uh, as Mr. Kayleigh mentioned, uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, uh, yes, our float did take third place in the Open Division. Uh, the photo that you see on the slide was sort of the work in progress. Uh, so congratulations to the horticulture students. Uh, in essence, they were building a, a scaled version of a log cabin, along with a few other uh, components on the float to highlight the horticulture program. Uh, and as Mr. Kayleigh said, typically we alternate uh, between the horticulture program and our criminal justice program. So next year, uh, we'll see what chances there will be criminal justice next year. Is there any other shop that wants to get in on the parade, or is there any At this point, no. Okay. <clears throat> program advisory dinner and meetings occurred last week. Uh, a 
again, I want to thank uh, the culinary program. They put on one heck of a dinner. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Bianca and Mr. LaRoe for a new addition to this particular program, trying to, again, combine uh, the program advisory along with recognizing all of our co-op employers, many of which are advisory members. Uh, so we handed out our first ever awards recognizing the co-op employers. Uh, again, the vision is, you've probably seen this in, in various uh, businesses, you'll see a plaque or whatever for a sponsorship or whatnot. It's just recognizing that particular employer as a co-op uh, partnership with the school, and hopefully that will expand you know, as time goes on. So that was a great evening. In the meetings, I think, were great. They were well attended. I haven't seen an, an attendance that high in a long time, so that was great. The athletic trainer model, I, I just, again, I need to take a moment to get on my soapbox for a moment. And talk about the athletic trainer. I'm not sure if this has been a discussion at NPS. If it hasn't, probably should be. It has been. Okay. Are you aware of that? <laughs> yeah. For the full board, and if Mayor, if you know the history, I apologize, but I, I, I think the entire board needs to hear some of the history behind the athletic trainer. Um, so, years ago, a couple of predecessors before you, Mayor, um, had an issue with the hospital uh, and sort of taxes or lack thereof, and you know, what is this large employer doing for the city or not doing for the city. Uh, so there were some conversations that occurred, and sort of the agreement that was made back then was that the hospital would cover the cost of an athletic trainer for Northampton High. Uh, so and that's how that began. That's, that, their, that's their payment in lieu of taxes in for essence. <laughs> an athletic trainer. Uh, so then, you know, fast forward, you know, Smith Vocational uh, began to expand their athletic offerings. Uh, initially, there were some partnerships between the two high schools, uh, and then as we continued to expand, we really sort of branched away from Northampton High and having our own very successful large athletic program. Uh, so the question then stood, we need an athletic trainer. So the hospital stepped up and had the same agreement. Uh, so the hospital was now covering the cost of two athletic trainers for the, the two districts. And, and that's been the agreement since we've been here. Uh, so back in December or so, uh, about a week before Jeff Harnos retired uh, from the hospital, he called for a meeting to sit down with myself and uh, Anthony Chevelli from the hospital. I uh, brought my team together and we talked and uh, thanked Jeff for all of his long work and you know, partnership within the community. Wanted, wanted to let us know that uh, Mass General uh, has this large scale athletic trainer model that they're trying to really push out within the region. And uh, because Cooley Dickinson is part of Mass General, uh, what's going to happen is Mass General is going to sort of take over the program. Uh, so the athletic trainer that we have would technically be an employee of, of Mass General. And, but nothing would, at the end, user, our level, nothing would change. In essence, we'd have the same trainer, uh, we'd have the same access to the services, nothing. But the contract itself would come from Mass General. And then Cooley Dickinson would create a conduit, call it a grant, call it whatever you want, uh, and it would still continue to cover the cost of the athletic trainer. Uh, so that's what was agreed upon back in December. Um, so, okay, it sounds great. I think the services and PD and support for our athletic trainer would expand because now there'd be more uh, professional development offered by Mass General rather than just Cooley Dickinson, and there would be no financial hit on us. Great. Fast forward a couple months, and I get a phone call uh, from the hospital saying, well, what we talked about might not necessarily be true. Uh, we had a, a Zoom meeting with Mass General. They had a great presentation. I then get the contract for athletic training services, and it's not being totally covered anymore. Uh, what you see is basically a four-year phase-out is what Mass General wants to do. Uh, what they're recommending is actually not accurate in the, in the contract I have to push back on, but... The idea is this first year and the first year is this coming fiscal year um, that the athletic trainer service would be fully covered. Uh, the second year they'd cover 75%, third year they'd cover 50%, and year four we'd have to inherit the entire cost, which is what they're projecting is about $62,000 into the athletic budget. So this is news to us, obviously, I say us, and the administrative team, uh, not overly happy with how this is being played out. I just wanted to make sure NPS, you're well aware of the oh, same we're scenario. We're still waiting for our contract, though. No, you can look at it. But a trainer is legally required, right? Mm -hmm. It is yes. for a spe specific sports, not all of the sports. And they've got to be at the competitions. Yes. And that's all. They don't have to be a practice. They say they're not there during the... Yeah. I am in for certain sports. For certain sports, like football. And they have to travel. 
-hmm. You have to try. You have to travel with your own. Go to away games. Mm -hmm. So it's a mandate that we can't get around. Uh, the sharing, okay. Um, Did Smith College ever provide? I, I remember an athletic trainer coming from Smith College. Maybe that's where the trainer came from, but it was paid for through the hospital. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because they have, do they have a sports medicine program? Maybe something to investigate. Well, it's here for what it's worth. <clears throat> so right now we're in, in four years, we're budgeting sixty-two thousand, no, sixty-eight for a um, athletic training. Okay. Yeah, unless things change. Is it the same right. amount for MPS, or is it more? So I'm waiting for our numbers because we have a, a larger sports program, so it's yeah. going to be a little bit proportionally bigger. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's based on that. Okay. And the professional culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I will go through this as quickly as possible. Uh, so part of the, the board policy is for me this springtime is to announce any retirees that we know of for next year. And, and we are aware of two retirees, that's Mr. Brooks and Collision Repair, uh, former student alum, he you know, leads black and gold, uh, so that's going to be a loss. And then second of all, uh, my right-hand person, my resident historian, your secretary, uh, Ms. Carver's retired. So, uh, again, gigantic shoes to fill. I want to say congratulations, except it's a loss for us. Congratulations. It's a big decision. Thank you. A big transition. Yeah, if you get bored, you can come back. No, you, you, can, you can work for NPS. Well, well earned and well deserved. And lastly, in the professional culture, I had uh, the model board of directors meeting. That happened to be the, the meeting I left early to come back for the, the planning board meeting. Uh, personally happy that that was my last official meeting in my capacity as an officer. Uh, just general updates, uh, again, strong advocacy at the state level. Uh, I think the tide is beginning to turn uh, politically around the, the lottery, okay, hot topic. Uh, there seems to be a shift in, in thinking in the state house, so not quite sure that's still going to play out. There's still no guarantees, but there are more people who are understanding that lottery isn't simply a, an easy fix for all. You know, it has to be a deeper dive into discussion. So uh, that's really the biggest takeaway there. Donations, uh, there were three in the past couple months. Uh, one for cabinet making. Uh, thank you to Wright Millworks who donated a bunch of veneer plywood to be used in making some custom cabinets. Uh, criminal justice, thank you to the Northampton PD. Uh, they donated a 2018 Ford Interceptor SUV uh, to be used by our CJ students as they prepare for Schools USA along with uh, motor vehicle stop uh, instruction. And lastly, within Collision Repair, uh, thank you to Steve Frenza from West Springfield Auto Parts, Parts Authority, uh, donating uh, an upgraded digital mixing scale and a new computer so our students can learn uh, sort of the enhanced paint mixing process and, and how to use paint codes within the computer to then end up with the finished product that we need for the vehicles. Dr. Lincoln Hoover, the, um, the uh, admissions policy made me think state legislature makes me wonder, of course, the license. Is there any update on that? Thank you, yes. Uh, that was another update from the State House. Uh, unfortunately, the, the two sides, the, the Senate and the House, uh, the committee chairs are supposed to come out. Now, the hoisting license in both halves have positive feedback. It's looking good. The problem is the two chairs have failed to meet yet. So that particular To bill reconcile is, the language in the two bills? To move forward. So that's sort of being delayed. It's not being delayed because there's any anti-pushback on us. It's just more of some political right. turmoil. It's probably not a top priority for they're working on so many other things trying to find a common language. Not on the bill. I think it, there is our understanding there's more political personalities going on. In the news, uh, this is again talking about skills this time of the season. There was just a, a nice 10 years ago update about how our students did so well at the skills competition. Looking ahead, just a few updates I want to. I'm looking forward to actually tomorrow evening uh, the Chapter 70 funding presentation put on by NASC, uh, hosted by NPS and Dr. Bonner. So I'll be in attendance tomorrow night. Uh, you can always learn things about the state funding formula and how that works or what does not work. 
Uh, and then in early April, uh, we have a meeting with uh, SMMA and representatives from, from the Department of Ed to sort of look at the horticulture building, making sure from the safety perspective that the safety officer from Jesse has no questions, making sure we address all the needs before we start building. Uh, next week also, that same evening, uh, Thursday night is the 4th, Friday the 5th, uh, is the annual FFA State Convention. Uh, I do plan on going Thursday night to that dinner and awards banquet. Last year I went Friday morning for the breakfast. I just put it out there, I don't know if any trustees are planning on attending. Uh, but you have an option either Thursday night or Friday morning. So I'm going. Perfect. Which one? Thursday night. Um, Mr. Kalin and I were planning to go to the breakfast. Correct. Just have to sign us up, or yeah, I do. Okay, thank you. That Friday that we were just talking about, there's a policy subcommittee meeting, uh, and then that weekend, uh, I will not be attending the the actual conference uh, as I have in the past. But uh, fortunately, uh, we have a student being recognized yet again. Uh, we've been very fortunate with this particular conference. Uh, the student of the year uh, for Mass ETE from Western Mass is Madison Gurrell. You can see the photo of her being recognized here at the school. Uh, she's in the CJ program. Uh, so uh, there's a conference during the day. That evening there's an awards banquet. And uh, last year we sort of ran away with all of the awards. Um, it was almost uh, embarrassing. Yep. Yeah. So this year we have the student of the year. Uh, and I, I do want to applaud Mass ETE. I think they made a, a wise decision uh, this year. So in the past there was a statewide winner. Very fortunate to be the statewide winner in multiple categories. Uh, this year, they felt it was worthwhile. Uh, they, they have different regions within Mass ET, so you have a western region, a central region, north, south. Uh, so they were recognizing the student of the year from each region. So Madison Gurrell is the Western Mass chapter representative. So that's great. So we'll have more. The point is, any chance to recognize more students, I think, is better off to be honest. So they are recognizing more students this year. And then finally, April 9th, which is earlier than normal, uh, is our next board meeting, and that is because, of, again, the budget has to be approved. Speaking of, if I can just transition into right, the next fun topic, which is budget. The people that you should have the power the slides in front of you. I am going to skip the, the first two-thirds of the presentation. You saw this last month. It's the same slides from the, the State of the School presentation, which is why I do that in February. I uh, sort of give you the context. If during the discussion of questions, we can obviously go back if there's any questions about some of that data. But I'm going to jump to <coughs> slide 25, is budget overview. And again, where we stand right now, as a reminder for the, the process and timeline, uh, and sort of this process, Joe and I started when we first came here to Smith. Um, so the building principal uh, receives budget requests from all the department heads, academic and vocational. Typically, the deadline for that is uh, Christmas break, uh, December break. Uh, and then that gives uh, the month of January for Joe and Crystal and myself. And then depending if it's an academic or a vocational department head, we'll have either the director of voc ed or the director of academics sitting there as well. Uh, at times, depending on the request, we'll have Josh Shear, the director of IT there, if there's technology uh, requests. Uh, so basically, the month of January, spilling into early February, are these individual meetings with department heads who can begin to advocate for and justify the requests that they have within their individual departments. From early February until basically now, uh, Joe and Crystal will compile all of that into a, a general school-wide budget. Uh, we will then begin to add in uh, individual administrator budgets, such as Mr. Smith and, you know, and facilities and whatnot. We compile everything into one cohesive budget. We begin to then hope for a non-resident tuition rate to come from the state. We then, you know, wait with the city, uh, working with the city on all of the uh, net school spending figures, the, uh, the Schedule 19 indirect costs, all of those figures we have to add in. And, uh, then it's given to me for final approval, and we have to begin to fine-tune a budget if we're over budget. Uh, what you're going to look at in a moment is a budget that is still currently over budget, uh, which is why I am not asking for a vote this evening. Uh, but I did think it was in our best interest, and I think it was in, out of fairness to the board. I want you to see that, in a way, Smith Vocational is no different than many of the other districts in the area. Okay? Uh, we are not as bad off as many other districts. 
And as I said earlier this evening, I do not see a fiscal cliff. I am seeing a fiscal wall. Um, and we can talk about that you know, through the discussion. Um, I want the board to sort of see where we're at. I do apply Joe and Crystal. They made some very difficult decisions already to get us to the point where we're at. I made a few decisions over the last 48 hours. Uh, I will look for input from all of you if you have priorities or uh, focus areas or requests. Uh, but then we're going to go back and we're going to continue to work on this budget. And we're going to come back on April 9th with a, with a balanced budget. And I hold firm it will be a balanced budget without going into, into tuition revolving. I still stand firm on that. As a board, you have the right to make that decision. But as a superintendent, I just don't think long term it makes sense to build a budget by dipping into your savings account. And that's not sustainable long term. So with that said, <clears throat> the first slide I, I sort of, again, I, I want to uh, give credit to the mayor. Uh, I, I've heard the mayor's message over the last several years and, and the mayor's concerns around net school spending and the local contribution versus the Chapter 70 from, from Jesse. And that is no different when we're looking individually here at, at the school. So net school spending you see on the right, okay, uh, has increased just over 6% from the current fiscal year to what we're looking at for next year. Again, net school spending is the, the required minimum towards education. And that is comprised of Chapter 70, which is the money from the state, and the local contribution, so that balance of that bucket. Okay, so the bucket is net school spending. You first put in your Chapter 70 money from the state. That balance to fill that bucket is what the state considers your local contribution. If you just look at this, it's very easy to see by the eye that the mayor is correct. Okay? The state, over the last several years, has not increased Chapter 70 a whole lot. Specifically this year, we are anticipating an increase of 0.38%. That's nothing. The local contribution from Northampton is, has to increase 7.84%, which again is a heavy lift for the city. That's determined by the state. And um, those are the, it's hard for me to read. So those are the actual numbers with that graph um, represents, or the histogram represents the actual numbers. Set by the state, that's the requirement. Now I, I do want to thank the city. Yeah. Typically the city has come in above, above net school spending. Right. And that holds true this year as well. I'll, I'll talk about yeah. that in a little bit. That's more than set by. Maybe. That's the next slide. Yep. Right. Great segue. So when you say for pupil expenditure, local contribution, $26,000. So that simple, all I did, because I wanted to give the board a, a way of maybe measuring apples to apples as mm -hmm. close as we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because again, next slide, we're going to talk about the non-resident tuition rate, which is per student. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about these numbers, but somebody may say, well, how much is that per North Hampton student? Mm -hmm. So I simply took the, the local contribution number. Mm -hmm. Okay, divided that by our foundation enrollment that we had from last October 1 and did that math and it came out to be $26,012. The foundation enrollment, the total enrollment. Foundation the enrollment is the Northampton students. enrollment here which per drives people. all of this. So, and what's the per, per pupil? pupil? What's the per pupil spending in right. NPS? Is it like $15,000? Uh, it's higher than that. No, it hasn't surpassed 18,000, so it's, it's in the range between 16 and 18. I can't remember. So the Northampton Smith Oak students cost, um, yes, the city much more. But that's true for vocational schools. That's true for vocational schools as well as charter and yeah. uh, the tuition out schools. Right. They're actually um, receiving higher funding. Right. And with vocational schools, it's the cost of the equipment, especially like you're because you're not buying textbooks, you're buying machines. That that could be um, a cause. It could be a cause for the, the additional tuition. I mean, I know at, at looking at um, per pupil spending for vocational schools in Massachusetts compared to district schools in Massachusetts, it's always higher in vocational schools, mm -hmm. setting aside charter schools. So you'll see the, the per people expenditure calculation I, I made there, the 26,000, that's a 4.21% increase over the current fiscal year. Um, and just a side note, if you can take a, a brain snapshot of that Chapter 74 comparison, that flat line, okay, when we get later in the agenda and we talk about the Student Opportunity Act plan, okay, I will probably reference the flat line and Chapter 70 money, uh, but that's a side note. 
Syrian librarian. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> this next slide, this is not official yet. But unofficially, we are probably going to be in a ballpark of the non-resident tuition rate of being 20847 uh, Again, that is not an official number. It's a number that we're using for the budget. I think we're going to be very close okay, uh, once it becomes official from the state. That is a 3.84% increase from the current year. Obviously, last month you heard that you know there's been a time in recent history where this number went down, and that was a fear of mine. Uh, so that fear was not realized. It actually did go up a little bit. Um, but again, as a reminder last month, our enrollment is beginning to hit that 600 student threshold. So we're not getting as big of an increase in dollars through the non-resident student program because we have less new students. Uh, so we're going to begin the flat line. Uh, hence that wall that we're going to hit relatively soon. Um, Can any of the great minds here, in, with, in terms of um, the uh, this financial information explain why the non-resident tuition rate has increased the way it has, but the um, Chapter 70 hmm. has not. It has the same about charter or something. Or, yeah. Isn't it the same? You're looking at the same. Hmm. Right. The, the only counter argument, I'm not here to make same a counter argument, uh, but the local contribution for Northampton per student is again approximately twenty-six thousand. It's actually higher because Northampton is going above the Nesco spending figure. That means there's a higher level of lo the local contribution. Okay, um, but that twenty-six thousand compared to the twenty thousand, almost twenty-one thousand, mm -hmm. still means Northampton is paying more per student. Um, so we are the school is receiving more money from the city of Northampton per student than we're receiving per student outside of Northampton. However, transportation is on us. We're paying for their transportation. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's, and the it's sending, difficult. And that includes district. capital improvement. In capital, right. And uh, the sending districts are paying their own transportation. Correct. And Northampton, so the, North, are Northampton students shouldering the capital costs for all the students? Say that again? Are the Northampton students shouldering the capital costs for all the students? So all those capital projects that we alluded to earlier this evening are being shouldered by the city of Northampton, which yeah. in essence is the Northampton yeah. students. We benefits, sorry, are benefits covered by the fund city side for yes. the school? Yes, part of the indirect and, and we could charge the out of district, um, stu we could, could assess, put a capital adjustment fee on yes. the semi districts in the land. Correct. Which I think is a conversation we need to have. Down the road. So this slide I, I share every year. Uh, this is looking at sort of the, the total. Uh, this 14 million that you see for FY25, again, as a clarification, is not what we call it our newest number. Um, but this is sort of adding on all the directs and, and everything else. Uh, we're looking at sort of a grand total of approximately 14 million, just over 14 million. It's 520,000 more than this fiscal year. It's about a 3.86% increase in the budget. Um, and what's the student enrollment estimate? would be just shy of 600. Okay. <clears throat> so just some highlights. Th th these next several slides are more just bulleted points. I just want the, the board to be aware of. Uh, so the budget increase, as we just talked about, went up 3.86%. Uh, there was a survey that, that came out. It was shared with superintendents across the state. Uh, and the, the survey was asking, how are we doing with budgets? Okay, where are people with the percent uh, percent increases with the budgets? 93 districts reported. The average was a 5.10 percent increase in the, in the school budget. The range went anywhere from 0.64 percent all the way up to 12.96 percent. Of the 93 districts, I pulled out the CTE schools that had responded, and their average was a 4.78 percent. So I use this as a point of reference. You know, we're slightly below the average. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I, I just share that with the board. Uh, the non-resident tuition rate we already talked about is going up unofficially 3.84%. When we're building the budget, and you do have a copy of the budget, the draft budget in front of you, um, but the we are projecting, we are budgeting an additional eight students for non-residents. Uh, I just want to define this a little bit. Uh, as a reminder, <clears throat> We pay the, the transportation costs for our Northampton students. 
However, we can't have the transportation costs within the operating budget. So we have to use non our non-resident um, tuition revolving account to cover the contract for the no handed transportation. This fiscal year, unfortunately, uh, we did not have, we did not budget enough students to then cover that transportation cost. So in essence, we actually dipped more into the tuition revolving account to cover that. Uh, so we've talked about this over the last several years where we can't simply use the number of non-resident students that we anticipate being here as the budget number because God forbid, uh, we don't get as many students then this budget that's been approved by the board and by city council, then it means the city is now on the hook to pay all the bills. And that, that can't happen. So we have to be conservative when, when we're looking at projecting the number of non-resident students. This year we were too progressive, we went too far, and we over-budgeted, which meant we had to dip more into the tuition revolving account to pay for transportation. Excuse me, Andy, what is the cap on uh, the Northampton students coming here? Is there... The admissions policy says that we can, we can accept 150 students, period. The first 30 are prioritized for the city of Northampton. Okay. So after the first 30, obviously there's more Northampton applicants, they go into the larger pool that are reviewed with all the non-residents. So we'll end up with more than 30 Northampton students, but there's guaranteed 30. And so has the city on our side, have we ever put a cap in terms of how many students you are not. coming from Northampton? And that would be an issue if you did. Oh, I know. <laughs> no, I don't say that for me. That's I, just... Yeah, it's, this is Northampton. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just wondered, was there a cap? Not official. Uh, now, if you begin to dive into the budget sheets uh, on the revenue side, you'll see that the transportation cost for this fiscal year to what we're budgeting uh, is actually going down. Uh, so that's un unheard of, okay, but there's a rational uh, explanation. This current fiscal year we had to have additional van transportation for some of our Northampton students. Uh, that is, is diminishing so we can avoid some of the costs there, which is why you see the decrease in the transportation costs right, within the budget. <clears throat> when you say additional van transportation, is that students with special needs that have written into the IEP? Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, now back to the projection, and we're budgeting of plus eight students, not resident students. If you look at our enrollment projections, so that four-year trend, you know, I could argue that we can anticipate an additional 17 non-resident students next year. So potentially we might be looking at 17 additional, we're budgeting an additional eight. That gives us that buffer of nine, which is not a lot. Okay, years ago we had a bigger buffer. So my point is to balance a budget, we all know you balance a budget by increasing your revenue or decreasing your expenses. Uh, there's not much more we can do to increase our revenue uh, to make this budget work. Again, I just want to sort of outline net school spending very quickly. Again, very upper level, uh, basic understanding of net school spending. <clears throat> so again, it's your state money, which is Chapter 70. You add it to your local contribution from the city, and that equals your net school spending, which is uh, dictated by the state. Okay, so that's the basic formula. Chapter 70, this year we're getting 934000 from the state. That means our net school spending figure is just over $4 million. So again, that gap, that difference, uh, is what the city has to come up with uh, at a minimum. What is in the budget for the local contribution is a $3.7 million. That includes, uh, Dr. Bonner was alluding to it, uh, all the indirect costs to the city. So health insurance and so on and so, on, so forth, a portion of the mayor's salary, HR, payroll, things like that. There's a, many different things that go into the indirect costs. Plus additional contributions uh, that are just above and beyond. Uh, so again, thank you to the mayor. Uh, part of your promise to the schools has been to continue to, to increase. So you know, we, we realize that in, in additional funds through the local contribution, along with uh, some of the capital projects that have been funded or have been approved by the city level. Because these projects are approved at lower than $150,000 per project, the city can count them towards extraordinary maintenance when it comes to any year reporting back to the Department of Ed. Uh, so it's great, I just say this, just to say it, uh, thank you, we need these capital projects to be funded. There's no way we can sustain this, this campus without the projects. But the flip side is, as we fund projects, that then means there's less money in the operating budget. Okay, it's a seesaw balancing act. Uh, if that makes sense. Um, 
On top of all of that, though, uh, there's about a quarter of a million dollars on top of all of this that, that are additional, potentially additional capital projects. Uh, so again, I want to thank the mayor, you know, the division, and, and truly the uh, the promise to the schools, both the school districts. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that is not reflected in, in these budget figures. Indirect costs. I just want to highlight this. We've talked about health insurance in, in recent meetings. The employer side of the health insurance you can is captured within the indirect costs. We are only budgeting an increase of 0.29% in our overall indirect costs. And again, one of those charges is health insurance. Uh, it's only an increase of about $5,500. Um, why is that happening? I think it's, you know, the members, you know, what plans are the members choosing? Um, I, I know overall there's like a 9% in, uh, increase in health insurance, but we have many options that members can choose from, and some of those options that are higher uh, increases we don't have here, so uh, the numbers aren't choosing. So, sorry, the overall increase you, you're estimating at nine percent. The city is you know, the nine. city's estimating overall health insurance is going up about nine percent. Nine, yeah, it is nine percent. Okay. For some reason, I thought it was higher. But within Smith Boat, the indirect costs that go back to the city that include you know, many things that are included in the indirect cost. One of the costs is health insurance, mm -hmm. uh, but the overall indirect cost, again, is only a, a 0.29% increase in the budget, so that's good news. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, so I took the opportunity to go through the budget. This evening, I do not plan, unless the question specifically in the budget document that all of you have, which is this multi-page set of numbers, okay? I felt it was worthwhile to more of a narrative, qualitative discussion um, to kind of show you some major impacts on the budget. And, uh, and listening to the board over the last few months, I think there's been discussion around the difference between percent increases versus the dollar figure. Uh, so what I, I wanted to highlight some high percent increases or decreases and, and then the, the associated dollar figure to show that there are some cost centers where there's a very high percent increase. You've got the trustees right on top of it. <laughs> You're very important. Uh, I knew somebody was going to say that. Alphabetical. <laughs> it's literally in order of the budget. And trustees are first the budget. Somebody's got to teach you your alphabet. Uh, so I, I sort of took the exercise of looking at cost centers that had an increase or a decrease of 5% or more. And I had a couple I put in, in italics because they, they don't meet that threshold of 5% up or down. And we don't have anything to do with that trustee increase. Oh, yes. We teach. Just for the record. <laughs> uh, that was city, city council. City council. I had nothing to do with it either. Okay. So no one here. But to take the first two that you see on the slide, I think it's, it's just a great case study. Uh, we can joke about it, but I think it's a great, a great example. So yes, the trustees are going up 24% because of the stipends, but that's only a $13,000 increase in the budget. Because okay. there's only three, three of us, because mm -hmm. the two Correct. of you don't. Correct. Okay. The teacher salary, now, this isn't strictly teacher salaries. This, the cost centers, the salaries, the longevity, curriculum writing that we set aside, everything that's earmarked directly for academic and, and vocational instructors. This does not include other unit team members. It, it doesn't include guidance counselors. They're separate. But it does include stipends? That are that are associated with the people in their role. Yes. So. Not coaches. Okay. Not club advisor. That's separate. Nothing. Okay. Andy has these listed by the cost center. Okay. That's why they're in that order. Gotcha. So you'll see that's a 5.54 percent increase, which is not gigantic. But when you look at the dollar figure, because that's the vast majority of our our staff here on campus, you're looking at a you know, twenty to fifty-eight thousand dollar increase. Uh, substitutes, I just want to point out, you see a looks like a big decrease, uh, it's a $19,000 savings. So what's happening there, and I'll talk about it later, uh, through attrition we are not going to fill an educational associate position, uh, which is, uh, in layman's terms, sort of our, our permanent daily sub who comes in every day. Uh, we're not filling that position, we are increasing the daily sub rate uh, to hopefully have more daily subs available. Uh, but by making a decision, we still see a savings of, again, approximately $19,000 in next year's budget. But will mm -hmm. there be coverage? Yeah. So, brace yourself, because it's very challenging to get subs. Yes. Uh, I think 
right now we've been struggling over the last several years to find the subs. Uh, recently we've had more luck, uh, but yes, fingers crossed that will. Mm -hmm. So guidance counselors aren't part of the. It's a separate that, cost that, that, center. What's it called? What is what is that? What's guidance that? social work. You'll see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Paraprofessionals, you see a large percent increase, $70,000 increase. Uh, the big attribute to this, uh, there's a paraprofessional that we've been covering in one of our special ed grants. Uh, that special ed grant could no longer support. We can move it into the operating budget. So we're not adding staff necessarily. Uh, this is just moving into the operating budget. There's a, an addition there. Instructional materials I put in italics just because I want the board to realize that Joe and Crystal uh, have done a lot of work to try to find money where possible. And in my career, instructional materials is typically a hot topic where why can't we just cut instruction materials? It's an easy one. Okay, we're not cutting staff or, or anything. I want people to see on the board, we're only projecting a 0.58% increase. That's a $1,700 increase in instructional supplies. And I believe last month I, I shared with the board, you know, when I sat in the department head meetings, especially on the vocational side, <clears throat> You go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you know that you know the inflation has increased cost of copper and lumber and so on and so forth. And every meeting, meeting in and meeting out, we kept hearing seven percent increase, seven percent increase in materials. Uh, we're just not in a position to support all of that. Uh, so in essence, we are level funding instructional materials. And just as a reminder, I know all of you are well aware of the difference between level funded and level services. Uh, level funding sounds like that's a fair thing, but in reality, if we level fund the line, specifically in instruction materials, we are not level servicing that particular line. So chances are there will be less wire and less lumber in front of our students next year because we'll have less money to go around. Same money, but it doesn't go as far. How, how much do we spend on instructional materials? I should be able, I should be able to do the math if it's... <coughs> Uh, we budgeted two hundred ninety-four thousand four hundred and forty. We currently have expensed two thousand two hundred and seven thousand twenty-nine dollars. We have forty-nine thousand one hundred and forty-four dollars in encumbrances, leaving thirty-eight thousand open currently. That was as of March twenty-first. Okay. When does that purchasing usually happen? Throughout the year or in a certain? Throughout the year. And then usually January, February, uh, I, I, I'm totally opposed to my past life, we call it budget freeze. Uh, I do not like that term because as a vocational school, we can't freeze a budget. We still have a shop, you know, multiple shops to operate. Uh, so ordering has to occur. But what happens around January, February, we put the notice out to the staff and uh, not that we, we don't oversee the spending of the school, but we really go through with a fine tooth comb. Uh, it really needs to be a, a true need to order something at that point uh, to try to realize some of the savings, which then allows us, you know, we've gotten into this pattern, which has been great. Uh, oftentimes in the springtime, we will be in the black, we'll have money available. And oftentimes that money available, we can begin to pre-purchase for the following year. So as an example, textbooks, we have to budget textbooks every year, but oftentimes we're able to purchase some of those textbooks out of, out of the current fiscal year, which then frees up money for the next fiscal year. So we try our best to be very, very cognizant in the springtime to see if we can realize some savings, begin to pre-purchase, and then give us more freedom next year. Um, but again, my point is, instruction materials, there's not a whole lot we can achieve. Okay? Dues and memberships uh, is, it looks like a, a major hit. It's about a $4,000 reduction. That is simply going through various dues and memberships for our staff uh, that we're able to save on after this coming year. A lot of times that's the cycle of the various licensing and, and whatnot. It's just a year that we can have some savings. Uh, guidance and social work, that cost center, uh, is an increase of 8.83%. It's a $27,000 increase. That's not new staff. That's just lane changes, longevity, so on and so forth. Um, athletics. Again, I put it into italics. It does not meet my threshold of plus or minus 5%, but my career has always been athletics is a hot topic. When it comes to budget and, you know, what do we cut? And as you can see, we are, we've already made some decisions within the athletic budget. You see it going down 1%, about a $3,000 savings. Uh, making the, the decision, there was some hope that maybe we could offer a, a golf program. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, so, and there might be some savings in transportation uh, a little bit there as well. Uh, so, again, the point is, 
there's not a whole lot there to cut unless we start to cut programs. Student activities, uh, there's an increase uh, that is to continue to support FFA and skills, not necessarily increasing those two areas, but they're captured in that cost center. But along with, again, I, I give Joe a lot of credit with his leadership looking at ways to increase the school climate here on campus. We've had more offerings around assemblies and programs and so on and so forth. All of that is within that particular category. I really appreciate how you presented this. It's so easy to digest Good. and understand the impact. This next slide sort of became a new slide because we had, had so many, but it also works out with this second slide is more of the, the facility side of the budget for the most part. Okay, uh, and this is where uh, again, this is no fault to anybody. This is sort of just the cost of doing business nowadays and, uh, and doing business in an older campus. <clears throat> so custodial, you see a, a large increase, 16% increase. That's 119,000. Uh, I'm going to get back to that uh, in a little while, uh, but a substantial. Part of that is a uh, cleaning service that we want to continue. With. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Heating costs, we're projecting an increase of 38%, almost a 39% increase in heating costs this coming year. That's a $60,000 increase. Utilities, 17.74% increase. That's a $50,000 increase in utilities. Security is coming down. It looks like a large percentage, 20% decrease. That's only $3,000. And that is, uh, again, thank you to the city uh, with the upgrades of the radio system you know, to the fire department citywide. We are uh, anticipating an increase of some new radios coming here, and that would be a savings that we can realize within that particular budget. Maintenance of equipment is an increase. Uh, we just have, again, at the vocational school, a lot of equipment that Tim has to oversee, making sure that we maintain. Uh, there's a, like a, an 11.5% increase, again, $6,000. Extraordinary maintenance. Uh, Again, 7% increase. This is like a $6,700 increase. I'll talk more about that. Um, this is sort of our capital improvement plan. Basically, our internal capital improvement plan, uh, where we've been able to fund projects, upgrades in faculty rooms, and painting, and, and other projects on campus that we've been able to do in house. Uh, this is just one line that we are now getting to the point where we may have to begin to cut back on some of those projects. And lastly, separation costs. Uh, this is just um, costs that we you know, as people leave that we you know, we're responsible for. Unemployment. That's not unemployment. Okay, um, Dr. Bonner, or, I don't know if you can say this off the top of your head, but those um, heating and utilities percentages do those look uh, do ours look similar to the NPS or different? Um, in terms of the estimates, yeah. Like heating, a, a almost 40% increase, utilities, a 20% increase. So those numbers, because of the way that we do our budgeting, they're, they're about close to whatever um, whatever was placed in our, our cost centers for that particular, those lines. So, but this is an interesting thing. I don't know if this is something that both districts can work together to kind of kind of lock in some of uh, the utilities and some of the costs, like electricity for one. We have been working on those contracts. And that will be helpful. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to get better contracts. Um, and I think you've had a conversation with Ben Weil, who um, is going to be our, our interim climate action uh, director. Um, and and he, he mentioned to me that he was looking at buildings um, to see whether there's some potential. Is that who you've been working with, Tim? Yep. yep. Yeah. He has a presentation, I think, March 7th, uh, May 7th, 2nd. Yep. And to answer an earlier question you asked about our first people, so DESE's data is very stale, but for the fiscal year 2022, it was roughly about $18,000 for um, per pupil on the MPS side. Just a side note, again, I don't want to jump to the horticulture building, but part of the conversation earlier today, working with the city, uh, eventually having solar panels on it. And the initial thought process from the architects is that uh, potentially those solar panels will cover the cost of the electricity for that building, which would be 100% electrical. Uh, so uh, while I'm fearful, as you see the utility costs going up, and now we're going to build an all-electric 
power and building, it's not going to be a good thing, but hopefully long term we'll see some savings there. So, so in summary, we have some decisions to make as a leadership team. I, I obviously will take any advice and recommendations and priorities from the board. Um, at the end of that spreadsheet, you will see that we are $162,227 in effect to balance the budget. Um, that's not where it was a few days ago. Again, Which spreadsheet are we in this one? If you, yeah, I'm oh. still in this, I'm still in my still slide in this presentation. Time. But if you went through the actual budget, the last page yeah. of the budget at the bottom shows a deficit of 162,000. So between now and April 9th, if, you know, as you begin to digest this presentation, as you begin to go through uh, the budgeted numbers, if you have any priorities of, as a board, you again have line item authority. Uh, you, you have the, the authority to tell the superintendent, I want you to reduce this particular line. Mm -hmm. and we follow through on that. But just some talking points, okay, just kind of reviewing. Uh, I am not saying these are priorities necessarily, but just some ideas that we, we've been discussing. One, as you know, unfortunately, Ms. Carver is retiring. Uh, anytime a retirement occurs, it's an opportunity for us to look at that model. Um, the model that I am looking at right now <clears throat> is that splitting the position it may eventually be the same person, but you hire an individual who is the administrative assistant to the secretary, to the superintendent, and then you have uh, a stipended amount for the, the board of trustees secretary. Um, and having that model split out, again, it could be the same person, but I believe at the end of the day there could be a cost savings there. Uh, so I'm pursuing that. Uh, also pursuing uh, the, the posting and the hiring date uh, for uh, Ms. Carver's replacement. Uh, obviously, I want to have some costs over there, but there could be a cost savings there if I don't hire somebody effectively by one, but maybe a little bit later. Uh, I do have Ms. Carver for a little while. Okay. Um, so those are things that we have to sort of map out and, and, and calculate to see if we can have some savings there. Extraordinary maintenance, uh, I, I already mentioned, this is, we, are, we already cut it back. What you're looking at this evening is not what the initial number was. Um, we looked at lockers, you've heard over the last several months, we've been upgrading the lockers in all of the shops. Uh, the money that we have still earmarked in that particular line will finish all of the shops except for one. Uh, and we may just have to wait another year for that one particular shop. Uh, and there's some other cost savings we may just have to cut back on. Athletics, I put it there just because it's always a hot topic. Uh, but I, I want the board to realize, you know, it, there's not a whole lot there. Student activities, same conversation. Okay, that's sort of that cost center that Joe oversees as, as the principal for assemblies, programming, team leadership opportunities, obviously to support applicant skills. <coughs> the cleaning company, this is what I really want to dive into for a moment. I already mentioned that overall custodial cost center was an increase of 16%. The dollar figure was an increase of 119,000. So you may say, Andy, how is that cost center going up 119,000? Yet that cleaning company's contract in of itself is 134,000. Because we're saying there's some other savings we could have within that cost center. Okay, uh, it, it's a lot of money. Okay, but that contract will allow us to have two individuals on campus in the evenings to clean. Uh, there is no health insurance uh, benefits required in this particular contract. Um, the hourly rate, if you really break it down for what that contract can provide us. It's, it's amazing. The, the amount of feedback that we've gotten from administrators and staff to say, wow, you know, we have a very really clean workspace, learning space. Uh, and again, that is no disservice to the, the custodial crew that we have. Okay? Uh, but this allows the limited custodial crew that we have to focus on other areas. And we've had a lot of positive feedback from the cleaning company. Again, it's a high ticket item, but in the whole scheme of things, I think it has a, a big benefit to this campus. But again, something that you may have to look at. Andy, when is the last time you went out to bid for that? So it, we just um, we started with them last year, um, oh. we're, and we're using extra funds right now. Um, and it was under a hundred thousand, so we got the three quotes. Just, but they are looking to get on the energy safe contract. So I. I'll, in my presentation, I'll open up to, again, just general comments to questions. Uh, I, I say to other. Just to bring us back to, you know, building D, um, and I shared this with the staff, I shared it with the board. Um, 
$162,000 is a lot of money. I know that. Okay? We have a lot of hard work to do between now and April 9th. Uh, but it's not a multi-million dollar deficit. Okay? So I do recognize that we're going to close this now. Uh, the long term, there's no way we can sustain this school every year moving forward to have a $150,000, shortfall every single year. Uh, I've lived that life in a former life. It's not fun. Uh, so, I agree. Yeah. Um, which is why, again, I really want to push the board for conversations around D building and or around programming. Uh, and or around what? Programming. So, I'll be very blunt. Um, we have, as you know, we have capacity within our vocational program. We have seats available. But we don't have enough seats on the academic side to bring more kids in above and beyond the 600 to fill the shops. As you know from last month, if we, <coughs> if we truly filled all the shops, we would have 720 students on campus. If we had 720 students on campus, we'd have an additional $1.9 million in this particular budget. We would not be having this conversation tonight. Uh, so ideally, we would have the space for more academic classes. How do we find more space? Let's get a new D building. Okay. The flip side to the argument is maybe we can't build a new D building, and perhaps we have to look at programming. I've shared this. Again, I'm not advocating for it necessarily. Uh, but 600 students really only supports 12 or so Chapter 74 programs. We have 15. So again, is the discussion at some point having to be uh, contracting a little bit, okay? Um, and when you look at a particular program that has two instructors and has equipment and materials, and you're probably looking at, again, ballpark, nothing to, to really set in stone, but plus or minus $200,000 per program. I just share that as a reference, okay? Uh, that's kind of what we're, we're entering that season now um, in the history of the school, that we have to make those conversations front burner conversations. And if you were to eliminate a, a shop, let's just say, hypothetically, so then those students who are in their junior or senior year, what would happen, what would the impact be for them not being able to complete their so years? The Department of Ed would not really allow us to say, unless there's like a safety <coughs> issue, would not allow us to simply say, you're done with it. It has to be a phase out. Yeah. So it would be a four year phase out. So next year we would not take any freshmen, we'd have our sophomores and you know, seniors, and then over the course of four years, phase it out. And the other thing we have is that we pay for the athletic students in regards to other high schools that have been charged, and we don't. Not quite. And, and, but it draws the kids in here as far as coming to school here participate in parents like it because it reduces the cost on them as well. Now that's a cost for us internally, but we have to weigh, you know, if we had to cut an athletic program or whatever, we're going to be looking at this budget too to, you know, do what we have to do. Another few closing programs, um, I agree with the athletic program. Uh, we talk about it with the, the leadership team. Ideally, if we were ever forced to close a program, I'm, I, I'm not advocating to close a program, I'll make that known. Uh, if we were forced to close a program, the question is what program? And then the question is, if you close a program, ideally those students would stay at Smith Vocational. But would they stay at Smith Vocational? Mm -hmm. So are we, are we thinking closing a program solves a problem? It doesn't necessarily <coughs> solve a problem if we then lose the students. Uh, so that's a, it's a very complicated conversation to have at some point, which again, let's find a way to increase it more, okay? Uh, I, I just keep going back to that. But the only way that's going to happen is if we have temporary classrooms someplace and we begin the conversation around a, a deal. Um, anyways, other thoughts? So with athletics, if you move to a pay-for-play program, right away you're going to knock out a cohort of students who are not going to be able to... Right. And I mean, we're experiencing that in, in, in PS. I mean, uh, there are the haves and have-nots. And mm -hmm. so, and although we have a sliding scale that helps with free and reduced lunch, there's still a significant cost for some students who may want to participate and cannot. So, I mean, you have to really think about that pay-for-play. I mean, it could be a partial pay-for-play, if that was some way to go, without losing your program. So definitely, 
the haves and have nots is a real concern. On top of that, uh, there's a notion, that, so I think it's a fact, that some of our student athletes have never really been student athletes in the past. Mm -hmm. When they come to the, to the vocational school, we have this opportunity. It's, it's worth them trying and getting involved um, and having that experience. And so not only the have and have not, just the individual students who've never played before, we're giving them that opportunity. If we then apply an athletic fee, not only are we going to lose, lose the have nots, but we're going to lose the, the percentage of the population that never played before. So why pay? I never played. It's not worth it. So I think we even lose more than just simply the have nots. As far as the sliding scale, I, I recognize, uh, again, former life, uh, athletics was a hot topic. I had athletic fees, unfortunately. Uh, the school committee asked me to increase athletic fees. I looked at sort of the sliding scale because I made the argument as a runner myself. The cost of running is minimal compared to football, so why should there be a flat fee for the runners versus the football players? So we had a, we looked at the cost per program and we found a sliding scale that tried to be equitable. Um, so that, but that's an option. What about raising tuition for non-resident students? It's state. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. We could reduce the tuition, but we can't increase it. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lincoln Hooker, who will you be leaning on um, most heavily for counsel um, in thinking about where we might make yeah. So we have a leadership team coming up. We'll have a few leadership teams, and it's going to be uh, an opportunity for the administrators who oversee various processes to begin to really dive into and advocate. Uh, I think, I think they're, the people doing the work are the ones who have the best sense correct. of what's absolutely essential and, and what could, you know. You're awesome. I'm all set. I'm pretty Thank you. Uh, I'd like to have a kind of quick report. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening again, everyone. I do want to say, <clears throat> just quickly, Dr. Bonner, uh, Debbie was right. So it was Charles Shushan from Howell Cheney Tech, and Rich Shellman was from Oliver Wolcott. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so again, I want to do highlight that uh, we did have. Brandon Diaz uh, resigned from the, as a student rep. Phoebe Perez from Electrical will be taking over. Current enrollment is 573. Admission season uh, has closed. That ended on March 15th. Uh, all the way up through April 1st, we'll still be getting tuition forms, and our guidance counselors uh, are beginning to get all the updated records. Uh, and, then, and then for those that are updated already, they've already begun scoring <coughs> and going through the admissions policy. So all those applications will be processed and uh, students ranked and then notification letters will be mailed out just before April break. Uh, and then they'll also receive emails over April break, uh, all with the next steps and, and, and packets. Trimester 2 closed on March 15th also. And uh, we we're going through that grade verification process and we expect report cards to be digitally uh, delivered on March 28th. We were lucky enough to hire a uh, health technology instructor, Megan Lagoy, who is coming out of uh, Bay State Pediatrics, uh, and she'll be starting on April 22nd. Uh, so that position has been open for almost the entire year, yeah. uh, through several rounds of uh, postings and interviews. And, That's great. Uh, so it's, it's a good one. Um, <clears throat> Skills USA district results. I apologize, my, my I didn't recalculate the numbers, um, but our those are represent our gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, the gold and silvers go to onto the state competition as well as the uh, student with the asterisks. Um, and our gold, just to read them off, is uh, Keith Cable, um, Aaron Fine, Ariel Ginsberg, Julia Roy, Annalise Hazelcorn, Keegan Kachopsky, and Dane Radwich. So congratulations to all those students. Sending your questions, that's the brief now, why would that one bronze student be able to? Go on. Uh, just the way that the, the the competition worked out, that he got bumped up to the state competition. Smaller field. So works out good. Great. It does happen. Yeah. Um, just I, while I'm thinking of it, um, I want to put out there, reflecting on your presentation on the ask, which was so rich and interesting, um, and the if I'm understanding you, your aim to embed the vision of the graduate in the work of the school, so mm -hmm. that, right, in everything that is done. Um, and then looking at the 
uh, report cards for Trine Institute made me think about um, this organization called Mastery Transcripts, which is just one example of things that are out there. Um, they're based in Winchester. It's a digital portfolio that um, could be aligned with the characteristics of the vision of the graduate that students would, once they, uh, once they accomplish, you know, once they met standards for the different elements of the vision of the graduate, the portrait of the graduate, that they would get competency in that. And so that would be something, it's a way to hope to bring that down to the student level, holding them accountable for demonstrating that they are becoming the graduate that we want them to be, and then also that they can share with employers upon graduation to say, not only do I have my transcript with these grades, but here is a graduate that Smith Grove wants to produce, and here's here is all the evidence for the ways in which I've done it. I think it's just a cool, um, diff another way to um, to, to uh, really align with that process with fidelity, the, the vision of the graduate thing, you know, to say that. Because I was really struck by that. You don't want it to sit on the shelf. You don't want all of this work to be just set aside. You want to keep it living. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, policy uh, um, for committee report, Joe, anything? Wait, um, did you say policy subcommittee? Policy review by the Oh, sorry. That's okay. All right. So, uh, you already got us in your mind. So, this is for you. This is for you. Okay. So, the policy subcommittee met on March 15th. Uh, we reviewed Ms. Scantz Hodgson's draft of an updated district policy regarding the maintenance of library materials. We expect to bring that policy to you for your review um, uh, and a possible vote at the next board meeting. Dr. Lincoln Hooker asked that we review our policy regarding longevity benefits for employees to see if we'd like to change it or confirm that we'd like to keep it how it is. Um, so your handout shows our current policy. Um, unit D, which is educators, unit H is administrators, and non-represented administrators negotiated these longevity benefits, um, five years of service, $750, uh, five to nine, uh, 10 to 14 years of service, $2,000, and 15 plus years of service, $2,500. Non-represented support employees, so paraprofessionals, vocational assistants, clerical workers, custodians, and farm techs are eligible for these city-determined longevity benefits. Um, five to nine years of service, $500, 10 to 14 years, $750, 15 to 19 years, $1,000, 20 to 24 years, $1,200, and 25 years plus $1,500. There are some employees who feel that the longevity, longevity benefits should be the same for everyone, and there are others who feel that the higher benefits um, have been negotiated as a function of union membership. We think it might be informative to survey all employees anonymously to see which option is preferred. Um, we could then look at that data and factor in, it into the recommendation we would bring to the board in terms of a policy. Um, and we'd like to know your thoughts about this idea. Surveying employees to see which is their preference of these two models. As to give us more information, we felt like in the small group that we had discussing it, that um, wasn't enough. We do, it's not something we have to do. We can discuss it here among all of you if you want. But putting out there that idea for some response from you. Surveying whether they would prefer the negotiated mm -hmm. or the, I mean, I would hazard a death. But we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. And there might very well be, I'm, you're, I'm, if I'm, you're implying that unity is the biggest, you know, um, let's say, and the folks who are part of the units with the higher longevity right. benefits would want to keep those <laughs> and not have, but there are folks that have been, who would like to extend them to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we might confirm that rule. And, and a, da a risk, not a danger, but a risk in surveying is, um, it could it could foster some lively discussion uh, about the issue 
um, which might not be healthy or might be very healthy. Or we're bringing it all to you. Not, not at all, but bringing this question to you, thoughts about surveying employees. Mm -hmm. Is this something you wish to move on to move on tonight? I, do, I don't think we have to make a motion for it, but it's something that, yeah, we'd like, I'd like your feedback on it. Um, do you think it's a good idea? Do you think, would you caution against it? So it would be anonymous. Every employee would get one chance to respond, and it wouldn't be traced back to who they were. And then we would just look at the tally of the numbers. So we, sure. yeah, we could ask them to identify um, if, what what they belong to we haven't gotten we didn't get that far but basically in our in our policy subcommittee meetings we said we need more information we don't know enough about how the uh, folks on campus feel about this i thought in the past we developed some type of longevity stipend has it been instituted or it's this right here okay so why are we changing it Dr. Lincoln Hooker, do you want to speak to that or would you like me to? I bring it up because there was a board conversation about equity with longevity. And when we made the policy a year and a half ago, why? Yeah, it was some, okay. Yeah. So that conversation at the board level has spilled over to the staff community here at the school. And unfortunately, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. Um, as a superintendent, I have received countless arguments on um, both sides of the argument that Dr. Spencer Robinson has, has shared. That some people feel, this is my term, uh, a year is a year is a year. Okay, so five years of service at Smith is five years of service at Smith. I don't care if you're uh, a custodian, yeah, yeah, a teacher, yeah, okay. Okay. others feel the additional responsibilities that teachers have to deal with, that administrators have to deal with, that that level of, a, of responsibility warrants the additional longevity. So there's a camp that says if you have the same longevity across the board for everybody, that's in essence a disservice for certain individuals. And because in my role I'm getting the complaints from both ends, yeah. I felt uh, that the board has to make a decision one way or the other to support the current model or to change the current model. Which in theory we did, not theory, but in practice we did. But you're looking to for us to equip you with really an emphasis, okay. the authority to say, hey, the board has made it clear. Um, we're going to stick with what we've got or no, we're going to change it. All right, so before we instituted this stipend program, whatever, you may wish to call it. We, we had nothing. We talked to, so the... These, but we had nothing before this. No, that's not true. Okay. So these employees here, they're eligible for the city determined benefits. Okay. These uh, employees up here negotiated... Yeah, through their duty better benefits. Negotiations. Benefits. So when we talked about, when we discussed, uh, we, we discussed longevity benefits a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and part of that discussion was should the, should everybody on campus, all the employees, yeah. have the same longevity benefit? So we're, we're, we're revisiting it now because Dr. Lincoln Hooker is feeling he's like been he's getting it. Swamped with dissent amongst the it's ranks, like, right, essentially. Exactly. So, I, so what, what, what we're proposing is to get a feel, get a, a really clear sense of what the employees want to inform our thinking about what recommendation we would bring, the policy subcommittee would bring to you. Okay. Um, I'm on board with this. Whatever you decide in terms of sur surveying. Okay. You're on board uh, with that? I'm really not on board with that. I'm on board with this. But so you want you... to keep it the same and not, not change it, and you don't need more data? Agreed. Okay. But if you feel... For whatever reason, others, I will consent to, to that, but that's my two cents And that worth. is definitely an option that we can consider, is saying right now at this meeting, no, we don't even need to revisit it because this is what we... Have you calculated the cost of How many increases are in which? Yeah. We, we did, oh, we, we did, did an estimation. Time. Yeah. It's, I, if I'm remembering, for the 
for the non-represented support employees, it was. I am so sorry. We've been working on budget. Yeah. Uh, I'll, All I'll, right. I, it, it's like with like ten or fifteen thousand dollars, I think. Okay. When I asked the question, did we, did we have something in place before this? You indicated yes, we had something before what? Before we agreed on this year and a half ago. Yeah. But it wasn't the, the top section. Because um, longevity benefits have always been part of the negotiation. Okay, contracts. but it wasn't. And yes, and city employees have always been eligible okay. for, long, for longevity benefits. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, the bottom section is what you want to serve. No, no, I she want wants it all surveyed. I, 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 I'm, I'm not in it. I, 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 so when Doc, Dr. Lincoln Hoper has anecdotal evidence that there's dissent here, and so I would like to have more data that says, yeah, if there's a real division here, or no, actually, overwhelmingly, people want this or that. We just don't know. Well, I think any other thing, just for discussion. Yeah. Uh, from the budget side of what we just heard in the last hour, uh, I don't know if we could even afford it if you do get a survey that people want. Another consideration. Yeah. So that it would be in line with let's keep everything how it is and not even and not even revisit this. Well, I think at this, time, at this point, that's yeah, exactly at this, right. I agree. At this time, I would not re I would not revisit this. I think we did our due diligence previously. And unfortunately, there's dissent among the ranks, and Dr. Andy's getting all sorts of complaints. And um, I don't think we could. My opinion is I don't suggest we move forward with this any further. Well, I concur. Dr. Bonner, are you going to say something? Uh, well, just to be mindful. But Unit D and Unit H, that was a contractual agreement. Yeah. And so I'm assuming that in order for there to be equity, you would have to move everybody up to those standards. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, that's a cost. Mm -hmm. That's a significant cost. So I, I don't know. I just I feel that um, you know, those are your professionals. Um, there is there's degrees that go attached to that, mm -hmm. and without them, I mean, everyone's essential, yes, but there should be some differentiation. I agree. Maya? So here you say city determined, and so what that means is that this is what the city is Yeah, not that the city's determined. Yes. Oh, I didn't know a different way to say it. <laughs> I, know. Okay. Like, I just want to clarify. I think that is, Mr. Quadra, what you're alluding to. So about a year and a half ago, that bottom half of your chart, those individuals were truly following the city amounts. Those amounts are not what the city employees are receiving. The board, you, voted to increase what they had. And I thought we to were doing those. better. That's why I asked you earlier today that yeah. question, and that's not what you told me. All right. I, you said it was the city, because I, I couldn't remember that. Okay. I think you, you okay. advocated for increasing, yeah. and we voted on increasing, and I assume these are the amounts we agreed upon. So I'm. I, I think I advocated for everybody getting the same. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. I stand corrected. But, we, but in, in any case, you're saying we agreed to increase them, which I couldn't remember because so I asked. Okay. Them yes. All right. All right. So and back. Go ahead. Back to you. Oh, so I mean, I I can't advocate for something that's different than that. The city's not represented. Which are I guess it are reviews. <laughs> so I can't or, advocate for even more. Were you a part of that board or not? I can't <laughs> remember. Is it? I think I was. Oh yeah, you you had to have been. Yeah, but uh, it wasn't Dr. Bonner. Yeah, yeah she yeah. was in here. Okay. Um, she so, inherited so, enough. <laughs> I, uh, Dr. Lincoln, I want to check in with you because you're the one who asked for us to revisit this. So what what would you like to see happen now? What I'm hearing is. Uh, some level of agreement within the board that what we currently have. We want to support as a board, and that's what I'm looking for. 
I'm looking for a direction from the board that I can implement. Uh, so that the decision is we want to keep status quo, status quo, I can easily support that. Um, That's what I mean. And is that something that we were, I was, we were planning on bringing this to a vote tonight, but certainly someone could make the motion if they wanted to. Do you feel like that is? Well, I think is this is a direction where I would recommend that back within the policy subcommittee that if there's any policy drafted, we can just put that in writing. So put into words what has been discussed here and bring it yes. to the board for a recommendation. Um, okay. So, so help. So is there, I, I guess, I feel like I have clarity from these three board members, but I don't have clarity from you about what you would like to see in that policy, or are you just not feeling like you don't want to? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's whatever you agree on as a policy. So yeah. Okay. All right. So then we will we'll bring a draft of a policy to the next board meeting okay. to be voted on. That and that will be part of the policy manual and on the vision. Sounds good. Thank you. All well, set. Thank you. Uh, facilities report. Yep. Um, just update on I didn't know if you were asleep. I was no, no. Oh, God. <laughs> Ring the bell. Wake them up. Um, update on the companion animal building. The, a little bit more uh, rough plumbing and electrical will be done, but they're pretty much close to finishing that up. Uh, <clears throat> electrical kids are getting ready. Maybe pull a new fiber optic from a building down there to uh, increase the speed and connect that building. Allegedly, the windows left the factory last week. Um, they got the big storefront window in on the south side. Um, Who's doing the windows again? Was that? Was that? Okay. Yeah. Um, and now we're going to go out for uh, open bids, hopefully in a couple of weeks, on insulating, uh, closed cell, and doing the drywall. We're going to pop, pop put that one out to bid. That's so exciting. Um, a question on the fiber optic yep. that I'm guessing is underground. Yep. And so where is that? being originated from? Server room here goes out, goes over to D building, goes to the corner of B, goes to the other corner of B, goes into 4th Street building, D building. That's where Josh wants it terminated. We'll come out of there and go into the companion animal building. And you're using uh, a raceway that or conduit that already has stuff in it? or you uh, have a spare? We, we dug up that road right on the back side last summer or last fall. So you have a um, dedicated conduit in the ground, some pull boxes down by the building. A dedicated conduit for this? Yep, there's two lines, there's a line for power, there's a box for power, there's a box for uh, right. um, data and, uh, and Josh's line. So, so that we'll get that going. We'll, as soon as the asphalt plants open back up, maybe mid-April, and I can schedule this. I, I talked to a couple of shops about having kids repair the road down there. Uh, so we can get that done, get those bumps out of there. Uh, the SOAR project, we're still waiting for some middles to go back to the engineer so we can get the manholes in. Um, we bought all the, the block for the kids to build the retaining wall, so as soon as the SOAR line is put in, then the forestry kids can build the retaining wall. Um, I think on that building, it's pretty much set up. I think that's it for that so when do you think the continuing animal building will be all done? I think they can walk in there in September. In September. Begins in September. And um, will there be like a ribbon cutting ceremony or some kind of? That's not my scope of work. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's our scope of work too. I think there should be a, to celebrate. And like so, all all of this work was done by you all. Yeah, all, all in house. Yeah. I mean, that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Well, we hired a we hired amazing. We hired we had a full time carpenter that pulled the furniture. Such an incredible accomplishment, yeah. and should be celebrated. So, so why don't you put that on our agenda? To you're on the agenda setting committee. Oh, you're right. Mr. Crocker, would you please put that on? Yeah. So okay, for this can, we summer can. coming up, we're gonna do what we did in culinary to the cafeteria kitchen, where we're gonna kind of blow up the ceiling and. Nice. Have Kevin come back and try awesome. to figure out how to put it all back okay. together. Okay, good. So. You did it before. Yeah. Important information. This heavy storm we had this last weekend, how did it end up down affecting down by the, the road? Um, I, I didn't really see it. I, I was I didn't come in on Sunday to see what it had done. I, I was kind of looking at the 
the marker poles that uh, the engineering company had put in. So that, that's what we'll just watch, see how it, the bank kind of uh, falls away. Well, I happened to go by it later in the day, and I looked down there and went up to Florence, and um, you could see the overflow coming across the pasture yep. towards the main brook, I'm guessing. Yep. I've never walked down there, I should at some point. Um, but it didn't really scour the pasture at all. No, I, I, yeah, I would think that the, that, you know, that, that grass is going to hold it, but it does when it goes over the bank. That's what our concern has always been. Over the bank at the, the stream at the, the at mitigation the, at the bottom of the pasture at the bottom that, that's where the stream bank is and the, my concern has always been that that stream yeah, bank keeps eroding yeah towards our pasture line we've moved the fence line a couple of times so so we've had some significant storms since yep. that's been installed have you seen any I haven't walked down there okay no but that's uh the tie bond is, is monitoring that for two years. So they're on the hook to monitor that. We yep. paid them to, yep. and uh, do you get a monthly report or a I, I wouldn't report? think a monthly. I think I'd, I'd wait a year and then I'd, you know talk to Donna, or I could just walk down there. But I'm not sure okay. how close to the bank they put them. Well, they're maybe if close. you can find some time, yep. that'd be great. Put it on my list. On your list. Yep. How long? <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Sure. Sure. Um, Morgan Records um, currently has all of the Board of Trustees minutes and are in the process of doing a test state. They did um, have a contract manager that I work with directly, so they sent over a test. Um, I looked at it right now, and now they're scheduling a meeting so we can go over that so they can begin the process. Um, based on what we sent over, um, I'm happy to report what they, the original estimate was 2400 um, It's going to be less. So. And so they can all be on our website now. So um, yes, and they'll be you'll be able to escape for wording and search. And yeah. this was um, one of uh, losing our historian that has been. <laughs> that was a because you say you would say Deb, hey, can you look at this or can you research this? And she finds it like that. Yeah. We you know we don't have that history. We'll all be searchable. Just ask Deb. Um, uh, who is responsible for making sure they get on the website? So. I'm not sure. So it's going to come back um, on an external hard drive, and we'll be handing it to uh, Josh. Okay. And uh, we'll work with Josh and kind of find it. It's exciting. Yes, it really is. Um, the White House basement is has been cleaned and is ready for the contractors. It looks amazing down there. Um, unfortunately, the city HR director is still waiting to hear from unemployment on the appeal for the seasonal designation. We still have the receipt. Um, That's for the coaches, right? Yeah. Munis accounting system. So um, last week when I was running my board reports, I noticed some, um, some errors in the encumbrances. And we're the only um, department in the city that uses the encumbrances for payroll. So um, Raphael is aware of it. I was working with Munis, uh, Tyler. Um, what they wanted us to do is wait until this payroll has been processed. We'll ask them to refresh the test uh, our training database, um, and Anne Marie and I will work on that to try to, with Tyler, to try to resolve the, the issue. They have no idea. Wow. So I had to hand go in and fix them for the report. Oh, wow. Um, GIC health plan rates. The um, employee portion is included in my, at the, um, the last page of my packet. Um, other than that, the third and final tuition um, was sent out on March 22nd. We're waiting for the special ed um, invoices to come from um, the Director of Student Services Office and the email as well. Thank you. Thank you. Under new business, may I have a motion to second to approve an out-of-state field trip to Oak Bridge Dairy Farm in Connecticut, May 16, 2024, for annual science students. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. May I have a motion and a second to approve an out of state field trip to on target miniatures, West Upfield, Connecticut, mid May date to be determined for annual science students. So moved. Second. second. Is it, those Any are, first? those are, the, the, are they different animal science students? 
I'd have to confirm that. Because if they're both going to Connecticut, can't they go on the same day? Like, is, that, is that part of, is that one field trip to two places? Well, the second date is, yeah. hasn't sure. been locked in yet. Right, I see that, but I'm wondering if they're both, if they're animal science students, well, they must be different grades or different. Um, yeah, that's a good point. And I'm not sure where Oak Ridge Dairy Farm in Connecticut is. Right. It would not be near Western Southfield. Right. As well, if you want to, we can withdraw that one and just hold no, it until no, we get into the room. Go ahead. ahead. So, Mo, while you are well, already. Okay, so any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the 2024 25, 24 school year calendar. So moved. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Are there any um, significant changes? I just I want to be transparent. The, what you are about to vote on is technically is not aligned with the unity contract. We've been doing an MOU over the last several years. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a faculty presentation. Uh, Unity did a vote, and quite honestly, it was overwhelmingly in favor of what you see in front of you. Okay. Uh, so it's going kind of aligning with, with what we've been doing over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the dates on the calendar, it appears to be earlier. But when you look at the flow in reference to Labor Day, it's the same. Okay. Um, so your vote is uh, is technically approving the MOU as well. Uh, but administrators well, and unity are in favor of what you see. All right, this is what you're presenting to us, and you've already discussed it amongst the ranks. So, I'm good. Yep. As a board, you have authority over the start date okay. of the school year. So that's what you're voting on. I just wanted you to be aware that the faculty had to vote because it is technically against the contract. They were in agreement. Could be problematic, no potentially. Theoretically. So just saying, hypothetically. Good, exactly. yeah, not not practically. Why are there question marks after the shock days? So, under shop right, under picture days, shop days? Because we don't have the dates oh, yet. Sorry. Those dates aren't okay. scheduled. I do want to just make a note again, the faculty was aware. Uh, when are you coming home? <laughs> December 23rd is a Monday. That technically, according to the holiday calendar or whatnot, that would be a school day. Which date? Monday, December, December 23rd. 23rd. Yeah. I made the executive decision to propose that we have that as a non-school day. We would have a very low school attendance mm -hmm. if we had school on that Monday and then the students were off the rest of the week. So what you're seeing here uh, is uh, Monday the 23rd, even though it's not an official holiday, that would be not a school day. We've done a similar thing with the day before Thanksgiving, which was always a long time with a happy day. Uh, we've made that a non school day as well. So that that's just nice another side note. That would be a nice break. It, I think it makes it makes sense. Helps with morale. Mm -hmm. Very good question. You set your um, high school the graduation date. Yes. So are you in compliance with so, the 12th day? Yes. Okay. As long as graduation is no more than 12 days mm -hmm. from the end of the scheduled last day of school when the calendar is approved, mm -hmm. we are okay. okay. I ask that because um, um, MPS was out of compliance, I believe, last year. Oh. And so it was brought to my attention <laughs> this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, moving forward, may I have a motion and a second? I think we have to vote on yeah, it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, well, motion. On the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. We motioned, yes. or we second, we had discussion. Now we're just waiting for the vote. All in favor? All in favor? favor. All in favor? Oh, yeah, aye. 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 Thank you. May I have a motion to second to approve proprietary products for the horticulture building project? That is what Andy talked about earlier in regards to. If you want to review it. Oh, I'll get a set, uh, motion and a second. Okay, yep. We, do we have a motion and a second? So many. A second. A second. Any further discussion? Yes. Just to give the board a, a quick synopsis of what you see in this letter uh, from SMMA. Uh, so, as you know, procurement laws, uh, if you want to buy any piece of equipment or anything, it's brought to bid and you know, whatnot. 
But we are allowed uh, through proprietary regulations, sole source basically, if there's a particular specific item that we want and we can justify, we are allowed to sort of bypass some of the, the more general bidding processes. So, so what you see here are six items uh, that we've agreed we want to uh, go through the, the proprietary regulations. One is the door hardware, and that is simply to align with the existing door hardware that we have on campus. Uh, it makes sense just to use the same vendor, the same contractor. Yeah. Um, Especially with the investment we've made in the security system. Exactly. Yeah, everything here is... Exterior the windows, thing. the same thing. The wood fiber, I just want to point out, the wood fiber insulation, this is a result of the 1.2 million in the state. Mm -hmm. They specifically wanted this specific insulation, which is why you see it there. Uh, and otherwise, all the other items that you see are because it's what we already have here on campus. So, uh, but we need to have a formal motion on a vote by the board so we can move forward on that one. So we've had discussion all in favor? Aye. Um, Thank you. The next item may have a motion to second to approve a school based health center member understanding. Member so and member. Second. Thank you. We have a draft MOU. Uh, I would be the one to sign it along with the Hilltown Health Net, uh, Network. I just wanted the board to be aware that we were the 12th hour. MOU, so, not MOA, correct? It's a change of yeah. uh, Memorandum of understanding or agreement. Okay, thank you. So just for your, uh, your comfort level, this particular MOA was the draft point. This is the, started as the MOA that Gateway uses with the Hilltown Health Network. We reviewed it internally. I shared it with our legal counsel. Uh, they reviewed it as an input. So what you see here has all of our stakeholders already given feedback. Um, I just wanted the board to have an opportunity to see it. I will then proceed, if it's approved, I will proceed to finalize it. We'll have services probably within the next week or so. Super exciting, but I haven't had a chance to read this yet. Is this what we got today or yesterday maybe? Or did we have this it before? Was yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Um, Do we need a move on this? Right here today, ideally. So, can I share with you if you're if you're concerned very quickly? And I know Andy will speak to this. So, this is a, a typical agreement that uh, an outside service coming in to provide a school-based health center would use, and it has all the specifications in terms of location space, um, the partnership of what the school's responsible for being for doing, mm -hmm. and that they're responsible for doing. It also lists the different. Um, uh, aspects of the health that they will be providing. So it's nice to see that there's a the behavioral health, the psychology. So you agree? I read you, it. Okay. But I also am familiar, familiar with the. Appreciate You're familiar with the, the whole, yeah, process. whole process. Absolutely, trust me, and we actually trust our attorney. Great to have your perspective also. Thank you. Right. So that he can move forward. We've been sitting on this for a while. It's been a process. Mm -hmm. it's a so we have this question. All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion to second for discussion with possible action of a vote to approve the FY24 Student Opportunity Act plan. So moved. Second. So discussion, uh, I to make it easier for your reading, and it's not probably easy reading, but I, I took from the, the GEMS website, I turned it into a, a narrative so it's easier for for the board to read through, but a quick synopsis. The SOA is the Student Opportunity Act. It's the legislator's attempt to increase Chapter 70 money, uh, but it's attached to making sure that we're focusing on certain subgroups that are falling behind to make sure we target them and make sure we you know, accelerate their money. Uh, that's the synopsis of what the Student Opportunity Act is all about. As you now know, Chapter 70 money is this flatline here. It's a frustration I have had with this particular Student Opportunity Act over the last two cycles. Uh, the amount of money used to draft this is more than what we're getting, which is, as you saw, flatlined. But with that said, I'll get off my soapbox. Um, part of the regulations is a school committee has to vote, um, and it has to be submitted by April 1st. So there's a deadline. Um, we have to look at the data. We reviewed all the data. Our students with disabilities is the subgroup that sort of sticks out, you know, with all the data points that the Department of Ed wants us to look at. So we've identified um, students with disabilities as our subgroup. As far as the, the response, the program that we're looking at, uh, because I did not want a heavy lift for our team, 
we did look at the school-based health center as sort of the programming. So even right. though that's not a direct cost for us, that's smart. there's some indirect costs such yeah. as technology. So you know, in the interim, we're going to have some telehealth services that you know, we need to provide a computer. Uh, so let's roll that in. Uh, and my argument is, as we have the health center up and running, our student attendance will improve because students will not be missing as much school. Having that intense therapy on campus hopefully will uh, provide the safety nets for our students so they can hopefully pay attention more and achieve more with the classrooms and the shops. In addition, there is another cost that, thank you to the administrative team, there's some online curriculum that we have begun to purchase uh, that we use uh, within the assistant principals, within our, our, our ISS behavioralist, uh, working with students, there are specific lessons that they can go through all online to learn about some better strategies on interpersonal skills, um, relationship uh, issues. So there's a cost there that I'm rolling into this particular plan. Uh, you can read it, I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. Uh, it's not a huge new program that we're creating. I'm just trying to make it as streamlined as possible, satisfy the regulations, and make sure that we're not doing a lot of work for nothing. Uh, that's my two cents. Perfect. So all in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion to second to approve the following surplus from automotive for resale. An electronic fuel injector tester, a 1999 GMC Jimmy vehicle, 1999 Ford Crown Victoria Police Interceptor vehicle, an OTC scan tool, and a Euro scan tool software kit. So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a motion to second to approve the following surplus from automotive for scrap. A 2013 Ford Explorer vehicle, 2004 Ford Focus wagon vehicle, 2000 GMC 3500 vehicle, 1999 Ford Escort vehicle, 1988 GMC 1500 vehicle. So moved. Second. Second. All in, no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Uh, as far as the budget presentation, I know that Andy reviewed it, but we're not making any. We're not making so action on it. There'll be no action. Um, so do we have to vote on that or not because there's no action? No action. So. Oh. Future business, April 9th, regular board trustees meeting here in the library at 5, May 21st. Regular hold on, hold on. I have a little issue with that. I had a previous engagement, I think, was in the book before this. Is This is April 9th got switched along the way, wasn't it later? And I made a commitment for something else, and I'm obviously um, in a quandary because... <laughs> the budget meeting. Yeah. Important one. Um, is there any opportunity this gets shifted? It really can't get shifted later no, because we're going to keep the city yeah. bylaws. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> it came to do it earlier, I guess. So that's next week. Which. Um, Could, could we do it Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday of the first week of April? That would make it very hard for... I don't know. I've got stuff, too. To come up with I, that's, that, I'm busy that first week, the whole first week. Dr. Lickenhoker has to talk to his team and get... Yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. It's unfortunate, so I will figure it out. And then the next one, May 21st, 24 regular board meeting at 5 o'clock here at the library. This is a change, uh, recommend a change the June 18th regular board meeting to June 11th, so that everybody's aware of that, 5 p.m. 
Hold on, hold on. That's so, a change to June 11th? Yes. The rationale behind that, the context, June 18th is our last scheduled school day. Um, it may be difficult to have a board meeting that, that evening. Uh, in the past, we bumped it, this has happened in the past. In the past, we bumped it to the following week. The following week is a state conference that many people, myself included, attend. Mm -hmm. So we thought moving it to the 11th would make the board the most sense. And you don't want to have a board meeting on the last day of school? So is that what no, that's coming that's, from that's you? That, that's the, the crux of the yeah. discussion. No, that's fine. Um, but I don't know if we need to add this. Also, April 9th, we're going to have our building committee meeting also on the day, right. at 3 o'clock, which I didn't make. It's this, so, okay. okay. So, Dr. Bonner, your job? Okay. Um, are One we, quick question. Are we moving the meeting, the June meeting? Have we moved it? We're only moving the June 11th. So, so we it's are from the 18th to the 11th. So, we yes. moved it. Very quick question. Is there any follow up on the field trip to uh, Italy? Okay. After that great um, presentation. Yes. Yeah, they it is so moving forward. So popular that they are now looking at they're, they're taking deposits to fill a second bus while in Italy. Because okay. awesome. we never really voted on it. So we need to make sure that that's added to the agenda. Thank you for bringing that point. So now, so now, I make a motion that we adjourn. All in favor? All in favor. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.